Plato and Atlantis with Tony Petrangelo. You're listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents and dolmens and wizards. To Brothers of the Servant Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the Edwards Plateau. And uh, we had an excellent interview this week with Tony. Uh, he's from the Discord, and Tony's been doing a lot of research on Plato's works, Timaeus and Critias. Uh, the dialogues and how it pertains to Atlantis and how we might look at it. And so we had an excellent two-hour conversation with him I mean, where he's given us context and pointing things out in the text, and it was just really great. So Yeah, yeah. Very educational stuff. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic show. So that's coming up. And we have a couple of one-up boxes. But first, let's go ahead and do a Space Weather News from SpaceWeather.com, where we get all our Space Weather News. Discovered auroras on a comet. Researchers have discovered another reason to visit comets. The icebergs from deep space have their own auroras. A paper published this week in Nature Astronomy explains how Comet 67P slash Churyumov Jeremyshenko turns <laughs> jets of water vapor from the comet's core into a weird form of northern lights. That's pretty I, cool. Yeah, I saw some pictures of I, that. I too. saw that story, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Current conditions. Solar wind speed is 477.9 kilometers per second. That's pretty high, I think. Yeah, yeah. And the density is very high, 12.5 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, uh, sunspot number right now is 13. So we are, of course, at a zero spotless days stretch. 2020 total spotless days is back up to 71%. We were all the way down to, I don't know, 65% for a while there. So it's gone back up. And let's see, neutron count is 9.7% plus above the space age average. So they rate that as high. I want him to write a brief, you know, description of how these things affect whatever's going on in space. Yeah. Uh, give me, give me, give me the lowdown on uh, well, what these things mean for <laughs> space stuff. Maybe we can do that someday because all of these things say have a little link below them that says explanation. All right, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so next, <laughs> next, next time, maybe. Yeah, yeah maybe. we can do that. But first, we got some one-up boxes. Uh, one of them uh, came. Well, Anne sent us <clears throat> first. She uh, consumed an entire box of Special K <laughs> cereal, <laughs> and then. Turned it into a one-up box. That's right. <laughs> Cut it open, turned it inside out, and mailed us stuff inside of it. <laughs> Builds her own boxes. <laughs> Thank you for the part that's not for the show. Anne, I really appreciate that. Yep. So. And she also sent us a book called Lost Gods of Albion, The Chalk Hill Figures of Britain by Paul Newman. And she says, I found this book interesting in its own topics and because the people proposing histories for construction were of the same social class and education as those proposing histories for Egypt. In fact, Sir Flinders Petrie was one of the people who examined these hill figures. Hmm. Sort of an established thought pattern, she says. Awesome. Interesting. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. Always uh, warm and fuzzies. Much yeah. appreciated. Thank you very much. And then... Uh, Henry Hablack sent us Hablack. A, uh, a new, I don't know what you call this, portfolio of artwork. It's awesome stuff, full of dolmens and wizards. Wizards. That's and, why I put that in the intro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'll be taking some choice pics of these and, and posting them up in the cube, so I appreciate that, buddy. Really cool. I like the direction you're going here. Yeah. And I think... You know, you might be onto something with how they made these dolmens. Yeah. <laughs> There's little booklets and uh, lots of images, but some of them show, like, beautifully rendered. You know, Henry has this sort of uh, 
uh, he's got his own like style a, for sure. Like tribal. Almost, yeah, it's very like tribal, but he uses it, and he's using like ochre red and black. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, on a stone colored background. <clears throat> And a lot of the imagery is like very stylized, awesome looking images of dolmens or like Moai type statues and little wizards floating using red uh, tribal, tribal shaped magic to move the stones around. Yeah, it's cool. And to fight and giants. Some UFOs and, yeah, yeah. And there's some UFOs in there too. And some stickers for the guitar cases. So. Yeah. Heck yeah, buddy. Appreciate that. So yeah, everybody should check out his art for sure. Check him out. And uh, we also got a couple of boxes from the brew pastor, full oh, of beers. Yes. Yeah, which you will hear Kyle consuming. I have already show. consumed two of those uh, <laughs> fantastic beers. <laughs> <clears throat> and the brew pastor was also kind enough to send an extra box of a couple of beers for uh, for Johnson. For the Johnsons. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. And don't worry, GMA. I'm saving you a beer. <laughs> there you go. You better get your next show ready. That's right. So in the in the brew pastor box, he had a note. He says, hey there, snake bros. I'm happy to share with you this box of metaphor or analogy to a much deeper reality. The deeper reality in this box might first appear simple and familiar, but its true essence is community, relationship, gratitude, laughter, flavor, warmth, and appreciation for the weekly dose of wondering that we all get to share in through your work on your podcast. These brews... A mix of our summer and fall lineups will be sure to keep you laughing and refreshed for the shortest two hours of your week. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> and also, I don't know how cold it gets down there, but I threw in a couple of winter hats should your snake heads ever get cold or should you plan a visit up here. Wolf Hollow Brewing is only an hour or so north of the great stuff in the Hudson Valley, and we would love to host a Snake Force meetup sometime. Oh, man, yeah. Cheers to you both. And to the whole snake fam, your brother in fermentation, Pastor Jordan. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Warm and fuzzies all around. Uh, yep, I've I've had two of these beers. You'll you'll obviously hear that in the future show. They're fantastic. Beautiful cans. I mean, these yep. the, the the artwork on these cans is great. And uh I've been looking around and buying around around here, and I just gotta say. Haven't found anything quite like it, so yeah, a great product. They are good. So thanks to all of you who sent one up boxes, and Henry, Brew Pastor, and uh, everybody in the Discord. And we thanks thanks to Tony for coming on the show. Uh, let's go ahead and get in, in, into his interview because he gives us some great information, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. So let's go ahead and get into that right now. Snacks, snacks. back ladies and gentlemen brothers of the serpent podcast where there are no degrees only certificates of ignorance which i have my signed copy right here and uh mine's are, stuck to the wall uh, yeah well <laughs> on display for all to see <laughs> we are uh happy to welcome Tony Petrangelo to the show. Tony is uh, from the Discord. That's right. And uh, he is here to share with us his knowledge of the Bronze Age. And uh, going to share a um, slideshow on the on Tim A.S. What else you got for us, buddy? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, so, uh, yeah, Russ wanted me to come on and spit some hot fire. Uh, That's right. Like I've been doing in the Discord. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, wanted to talk about Atlantis and yes. some of my takes, uh, but I thought maybe would be the best way to do it. Maybe just be to read through the, the, the Atlantis summary that appears in the Timaeus, um, awesome. and kind of like MST 3K it. 
um, <laughs> as we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you very much for coming on, man. We're glad to have you. So. Yeah. Appreciate it. Looking yeah, for forward sure. to it. Yeah, no, for sure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for asking me. Uh, obviously big fan of the show. <laughs> Long time <laughs> listener. First time guest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, but before you get started, I have to uh, dig out a ice cold brew pastor beer from. Oh uh, yes. Yeah, and I'll also say that uh, while well, Kyle's digging for beers, Tony and I have had uh, many long and awesome discussions in the Discord, and you know we don't we we're usually arguing with each other, bickering and arguing, but he has fantastic information, uh, and you know no one has conclusions on any of the, any of this ancient stuff, and the whole subject of Atlantis is fascinating, but he's been doing a lot of research on it and all of the all of the you know the information around the stuff that he's looking at has just fascinated me so i was like dude you've got to come on the show let's talk about all this stuff you're finding out and he agreed to do that so this is like we're having a string of snake forest discord guests so this is really yeah. cool <laughs> that's cool all right man yeah it's it's cool and, the, and it was i guess it's the the combination of the you know the the covid stuff and then the discord that ins, you know inspired me to do a bunch of research on this. So yeah, there you go. I, I owe it all to, 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 to do you guys in the Discord that I even know all this information anyway. So. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> you guys have to be the, the victims of it now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Lay it on us. All right. So, uh, I mean, I guess talking about Atlantis, uh, it, it all comes from Plato. And everything from Plato essentially starts with Socrates. So, might just you know, maybe go through a little bit of background about those two guys, uh, the, the context they were in, and then some little bit about Plato. So, you know, uh, you guys are familiar with the movie 300? Yes. Great movie. Yes. So the Greeks versus the Persians, the Persians tried to take over uh, Greece and they were defeated in the movie 300 by the, well, they weren't really defeated by the Spartans. Uh, the Spartans ended up losing that particular conflict, but uh, anyways, the, the, the long and short of it is Greece, def, you know, uh, defeats Persia, which is this giant empire at the time. And Athens, as a result of that, sort of becomes, you know, the, the, the for, foremost city state of Greece. Mm. Uh, so they, they have this, this, this kind of through some other events that happened before the war, they have this giant navy. And then after the war, they use this giant navy to sort of you know, help a keep Persia out, but also they kind of set up like a defense league. And then this kind of leads to some other stuff. But so Socrates kind of is born and he grows up during the height of this Athenian post Persian war boom, Hmm. um, where Athens is, you know, they're, they're building stuff all over the place. They're, they got wealth coming in all over the place. And so Socrates is seeing like all these you know, all these different thing, things changing, plus all this art happening too. There's just plays being written all over the place. It's just, it's this whole boom time of Athens, like cl- basically classical Greece, this Greece, this is the, the birth of classical Greece is after the, uh, after the Persian war. Um, so Socrates gets this, you know, reputation as this sort of, you know, guy who's just always going around talking to people about stuff and, you know, um, but he, the, the the conception most people get of him now or that that's presented by Plato and presented by academia is that he just asked questions. So he, he was interested in virtue primarily questions of virtue. Can virtue be taught? What is virtue, mm. different elements of virtue, like knowledge, courage, these things. Um, but there's other thoughts on that as well. Um, you guys listen to a podcast about uh, Astrophanes, the clouds, Yep. which presents Socrates in a completely different light. Yeah. Presents Socrates as somebody who very much is interested in, you know, questions concerning the cosmos, questions concerning, you know, the origin of life, questions concerning the soul. Um, so this kind of thing about who is Socrates is sort of a big question in Socratic and Platonic st- studies. So Plato was a disciple of Socrates, so to speak. Um, Socrates died in like 399. Plato was born sometime in the 420s. So he didn't spend that much of his life with Socrates before he died, but he was certainly, um, you know, one of his, one of his disciples before that happened. And he picked up a lot from Socrates, but the question always kind of is what parts of the platonic dialogues are Plato and what parts are Socrates, right? Like Socrates is the main character essentially in all the dialogues. So, you know, 
is Plato just using Socrates as a mouthpiece so that he can, uh, you know, do his own philosophy? Or is these things that Socrates taught Plato and that Plato is now kind of passing on? Um, Plato's dialogues themselves get kind of divided into three, three different types of dialogues. And they're sometimes considered, these terms, are, it, it, it's sometimes considered a chronology. There's, they're considered like early dialogues, middle dialogues, late dialogues. And it's possible they are chronological, but there's really no evidence for when the dialogues were written. Mm. So it seems like the early dialogues were probably written early just because there is like a progression of style and there's a progression to so the character of Socrates progresses. But, you know, you'll often hear, hear Plato dogs referred to as early, middle or late. And that doesn't necessarily imply chronology. It more implies like the, the content of the dialogue. Okay. So the early dialogues are like the Socratic, what are called the Socratic dialogues. And it's basically Socrates arguing with people. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, he's either arguing with sophists who are like the, the teachers at the time who are trying to like, you know, impart, they're, they're essentially, you know, uh, collecting money to teach people to try to teach virtue. So this is a thing at the time is can virtue be taught? The sophists are teaching virtue. Socrates is like, can virtue even be taught? That's basically his thing. Like, okay. you know, these sophists are all claiming they can teach virtue. Is that even a thing that can be taught? So a lot of these early dogs are a him arguing with sophists, basically trying to, you know, show them or show other people that the sophists don't really know what they're talking about or arguing with people who it seems like he thinks they might be good students. And he's trying to show them that they really don't know anything so that they will maybe follow him and become students of his. Mm. The middle dialogues, you get more into like philosophy. So, uh, you know, the, the nature of the soul and, and the, the, you know, whether the soul is eternal, uh, whether the soul is reborn. Uh, you'll hear oftentimes uh, when people talk about Plato is his theory of the forms. Yep. His theory of the forms is really interesting because sort of like this question of virtue and what is virtue and what is knowledge, what is courage, it all kind of led down this avenue of like what are all these things in their like absolute true nature you know um and so he, he gets down to like this idea of everything has its like sort of pure form so there's like a pure form of virtue and everything we see in the real world is just sort of this like not quite pure version of the form of virtue or knowledge or a couch you know what i mean so it, this kind of evolves over time but to me, it, I don't know, it, it, it reminds me of quantum physics in a way, right? Like behind reality, there's this other reality of pure stuff. Um, and I might be misreading that, but it, when every time I hear Plato talking about the forms, I think of that, like the reality behind the reality. I, def um, I, I definitely think that the idea of it, you know, we've talked to Randall about this quite often too, is the idea that there is an idea behind all of these things that are then represented in the material realm in an imperfect way in the same way that like an architect's diagram is like a an idealistic you know image or idea or concept of a structure that once you build it it's going to have flaws and you're going to have the measurements aren't going to be perfect like they are in the drawing so i definitely get that part of it is that and there, there's also to me what i thought of was some of the stuff that i learned in uh that cheng shin school mm. which is like um, our perception of things is not the thing itself. Yeah. Right. We have our perception of a tree, but that's not actually a tree. A tree is one thing. Our perception of it is something else. So that, that's kind of what it made me think of. There is um, the real thing itself, which we can't actually fully perceive, fully understand because yeah. we're, we're dealing with perception you know, in a physical world. So, yeah, well, that's, I think that's, I mean, that's exactly it. We're, and I guess this gets into like his sort of unified theory of whatever, but the soul is, is part of that. So the yeah. soul can observe these pure forms, ah. mm. but the soul in the body. Yeah. Like you're saying is it's being filtered through these perceptions. Um, uh, and in the end, the, the, what he saw the forms as is like, like math. So the only way you could actually, represent the pure idea of the forms would be through numbers uh. through the purity of numbers and this is like you're talking about russ like the geometric like you can draw something or you can you can conceptualize something perfectly but you draw it out and it's not going to be perfectly it's right. not going to be perfect 
Right. So the, the only way the thing it can be perfect is the conceptual, pure mathematic version of the form. And I, that's kind of like what I think, that's what I get from his theory of the forms, essentially, is like the only way you can have the pure thing is to get down to the actual mathematics of it, the actual representation of it. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. interesting, because especially if you start thinking of things like souls, I mean, or virtue, like how do you, what's the math to describe virtue? <laughs> that's a well, really... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that, those are questions he actually never got to the point of answering. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, those are all... It, it, it gets into this whole other realm of essentially, yeah, like no, a number-based philosophy. Yeah. And, and that gets into like the Pythagorean influence on uh, Socrates and Plato as well. So the Pythagorean stuff, it... it, it for a long time, like uh, uh, um, Aristotle, who was uh, Plato's one of Plato's disciples, Aristotle talked about uh, Pythagoras having an influence, or, or Plato being influenced by the Pythagorean school. Hmm. But that had kind of gone out of style more recently, just because there isn't necessarily a lot of talk of Pythagoreans specifically in the dialogues. They, they're here and there. There's some talk of it in the Republic, and then Timaeus has a lot of it. But it's it's not. It, it's not necessarily like Plato is always talking about the Pythagoreans, but if you, if you kind of, and I'm not certainly not an expert on Pythagorean stuff at all, but I've read a lot of <laughs> stuff on people who are, and they, yeah. they, when they say, when they look at Plato's dialogues from a Pythagorean perspective, it's just oozing with Pythagorean ideas. Ah. And this goes all the way back to the earliest dialogues. So okay. there's this guy, JB Kennedy, and he, he did like a line by essentially like line analysis of a bunch of Plato's dialogues. Um, where he, what he found, what he thought was like a, so the Pythagoreans have like a 12 note scale and he found that same scale in all of the Platonic dialogues hmm. where you would have, you could divide each dialogue into twelfths and then at harmonic notes, there would be similar sorts of phrases at each of these sort of intersections within the dialogues, like note, note points. And, and you could like with each one, di each dialogue would have like a through, a through note essentially. And then like each sort of note would have like different uh, vocalizations, I guess you could say of that sort of theme. And then at certain notes that were like Pythagoreans would consider harmonic notes, like the sixth, sixth note, eighth note, ninth note. Um, those would be like good things. Whereas like on the disharmonic notes, then you'd have like more like bad or like, you know, less good ideas or stuff like that. So huh. It, it, it's it's kind of hard to describe without like getting into a lot of the the music stuff, which I don't know super well because <laughs> I'm not a musician. Um, but it, 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 there's just a lot of that kind of stuff in Plato's dialogues. The other thing too is he found at certain points, like the halfway point, there'd always be talk of like, well, not not necessarily the same thing, but always talk of either like truth or justice or Zeus, who was a lot of times you know the personification of uh, truth and justice yep. in the pl platonic dialogues. And then at like the, the 61.8% of the way through the Republic is the talk of the divided line. The golden so the divided, section. Ah, the, the divided line in the Republic is this whole thing about dividing a line in certain ways to, and then dividing it again in these certain ways. And it's all this whole kind of thing about the golden section and it happens like the beginning of that happens right at 61.8% of the way through the Republic. <laughs> so there's all these things like that, that happen in the dialogues where it's, it's obvious play. And this is the thing. It wasn't Plato just doing this. This was the thing in like ancient uh, uh, literatures. They would like have like lines that's the line, like the, the number of lines would symbolize certain things when you'd get to certain, like, you know, line X yeah. would symbolize a certain thing or whatever. So there's, there's all sorts of different, Pythagorean stuff embedded within the dialogues that uh, also can be teased out. And so it makes, I don't know, it just makes the platonic stuff super interesting to look at from all sorts of different uh, points of view. So the stuff the, the we're going to look at Timaeus today, and I'm going to read the Benjamin Jowett translation, uh, mainly because uh, that's the one that's available for free on Project Gutenberg. And it's so it's it's anybody who's listening at home can go on the internet, grab that version, read along, or you know read it yourself, and then say why you think I'm wrong about certain things. You got um, uh, you got links. Maybe you can send me. I can put in the show notes. I yep, I got a bunch of links too. Yeah. All right, cool. Awesome. Um, and then so 
all of Jowett's, uh, or all of, I'm sorry, Plato's uh, dialogues are available on Gutenberg, the Jowett translations. Uh, there's also, I'll have a link for you too. There's, you can get for free the Thomas Taylor version, the Thomas Taylor translation uh, that's available on archive. Um, it, I only bring up the, the matter of the translations is because uh, with Timaeus specifically, there's sort of some famous mistranslations and we'll talk about one, but just with Plato in general, some of the translations are just because the word used itself has many different meanings. Yeah. Some of the mistranslations are because the translators themselves have certain ideas about what they think Plato knew or didn't know that they're trying to, you know, say yeah. what they think the word should be. So one of the, one of the, the, the more famous ones from Timaeus is this word. It's a Greek word. And I'm going to, any Greek word we're going to do, I'm probably going to butcher. So <laughs> no problem. Correct me in the homo correctus thread of the discord. Because, <laughs> uh, hey yeah, man. So it's a, it's a Greek word, uh, ilesti, but the, the, in the Jawa translation and here, I'll read the, the actual line, the earth, which is our nurse clinging around the pole, which is extended through the universe he framed to be the guardian, an artificer of night and day, first and eldest of gods that are in the interior of heaven. So Jowett actually has a little parenthetical where he says, right next to clinging, he says, or circling. Right. So those are two completely different yeah. <laughs> thoughts on like what that word could be. Um, circling with gravity. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Like, so, so Burry, who's another translator, he translated as globbed. Taylor, who we talk about up here, Thomas Taylor, conglobbed. Lee winding. So all of these, I mean, like the actual literal translation is just rotate or revolve. Okay. But none of these people think that Plato knew that the earth spun. So they're basically uh, like, well, he didn't know that. So we can't, and we can't translate it that way. Hmm. Uh, so circling is kind of that, but clinging is like glob. Like they're trying to think like, Oh no, we think he thinks the earth is stationary. So we're going to translate it in a certain way. Yeah. So, Timaeus, the non-Atlantis parts, is full of like cosmological theorizing and philosophizing. So there's no doubt just tons of is instances just like this throughout it. So it's just that when you're reading Plato, when you're reading a lot of this ancient stuff, you got to be very careful about the translation and the, the just too about like, you know, maybe the the context the translator had when actually doing the translation. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, a single not mistranslated, but, you know, a word where the person chose, had to choose a word out of a, out of several that it could be can completely change the meaning of the entire phrase. So that, that's, that's, that's for sure. You got to be careful with that. And it is, it is interesting to be able to look and see what other people translated certain words as. But yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the only reason I include these two different free versions. Cause it's interesting to just look at the differences between just the Jowett and the Taylor translations. Yeah. Um, because they're, you know, in some instances, pretty similar. In some instances, not that similar. Um, another thing, too, just when dealing with Plato, there's this thing called Stephanus numbers. Um, a lot of times, like in the Jowett translations on Gutenberg and in the Taylor translation, you won't see them. But in some other versions, you might. And there'll be along the text, you'll see like numbers with letters next to it. And it's essentially just a way of, you know, tracking the, the entire platonic uh, you know, all of Plato's dialogues kind of go sequentially with this numbering system. So it's a way to like identify a, a, a particular passage within a dialogue with a number and a letter. Okay. So just so, just so people are aware, it, it like when I first got into Plato, it took me like at first I, I was like Googling, like, what are the numbers in Plato diet? Like, I, <laughs> I didn't know like what, how to like understand what to Google or even like to understand what those numbers were. So just if anybody comes across that and is wondering like what, uh, what that stuff is, that's what that's all about. Um, so here we go. We're going to read the Timaeus now. All right. All right. So the first sentence of the Timaeus, I think is super important. So here we go. Socrates, one, two, three. But where, my dear Timaeus, is the fourth of those who are yesterday my guests and are to be my entertainers today? Hmm. So he starts off the dialogue with one, two, three. So right away, to me, I don't know, like I hear someone starting off, you know, I know this person's a Pythagorean and they start saying one, two, three, right at the beginning of a thing. <laughs> that like <laughs> yeah. raises alarm bells for me. Like, oh my God, what's going on? Here? First of all, I want to go back just a little bit. 
Timaeus, a lot of people think, is like a continuation of the Republic. The Republic is one of Plato's more famous dialogues. Um, we'll get into that a little bit in the next couple sections of the dialogue, in the next couple passages. But to me, this fact that he's starting the dialogue with one, to me, sort of indicates a break from the Republic and like the beginning of a new series. Okay. Um, and it, it, it's even outlining it's going to be a trilogy in a way too. One, two, three, you know, these are my guests. One, two, three, we're going to have these three things that are coming up. And that even becomes more clear as we go down because he starts talking to the guests. And then they even get into like what they're going to talk about. But then it's also saying like one, two, three, we're starting off one, two, three. Right away, we're saying numbers are very important in this dialogue. Timaeus, like I said, it's all about cosmology. It's all about, you know, the, the role of the creator God in, you know, making the earth out of the materials, try, like trying to represent the forms via these materials. And there's just a bunch of, of numbers and stuff involved. And so he's trying to rep, rep, say like right away, numbers are going to be very important in this dialogue. But there's also the Pythagorean meaning of the numbers. So one, Pythagorean one is, is like the unity. You guys are familiar with this, right? John Anthony West talks about a little bit about this. In yeah. Serpent in the sky. Uh, so one is like Pythagorean unity. It's not even really considered even or odd. It's like its own thing. And that's kind of what the Timaeus dialogue is. It's about unity. It's about the creator God creating things out of the materials that he has at his disposal, right? It's about the unity of, of the universe, essentially. Two, the Pythagorean two is division. So from one, you get two, you get the, the, the division, the uh, uh, primordial scission. Is that what, what Anthony West calls it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But, and that's kind of what Critias is about. It's the division. It's this battle between Athens and Atlantis. Um, you know, there's this conflict there. And then uh, the third part, which never got written. So Critias is left unfinished. And then the third part, which have, would have been the Hermocratus, who is the third person who's in the dialogue that never got written. That would have, in theory, if, if this is correct with this Pythagorean numbering, would have been about like reconciliation, you know, going forward after that division, like the two becoming, you know, becoming three. Yeah, I think um, I think in John Anthony West was saying that uh, the Pythagoreans also saw three emerges from two as the third thing being the actual uh, difference between one and two. In other words, the third thing is the fact that you have two things. Now you can see two separate things and that is the third thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So it, and it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Anyways, so then the, <laughs> other, the other side of that is then the fourth isn't there. Right. So I think that's key too. So to the Pythagoreans, 10 was also a very special number. One plus two plus three plus four equals 10, mm. but the fourth isn't there. So we just have one plus two plus three equals six. 10, 10 is, is, the idealized reality six is just like reality okay so i think in some ways he's saying because he talks like the republic is like the ideal state i think in here he's basically coming he's basically coming back to that and he's saying the here, ideal state's not possible here's reality here's yeah. what we can actually here's like the real thing okay um at least that's my interpretation of it so. <laughs> uh, all out of the first sentence folks that's genius. I, I, I don't know. I think I, I think he was starting a song and he was like one, two, two three. three. <laughs> and then he was like, oh wait, is this four four or three four? <laughs> well, and you say that, but Brett actually brought this up. The Pythagorean or the 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 tuning, the um Yeah, the circle of fifths. Yeah, the Pythagorean tuning. Yep. That's so right. there's actually a lot of theories that the not a lot. There's a theory that the Republic and then the Timaeus are about that. The difference between Pythagorean tuning and then I think it's called just tuning. Whereas I don't, and I don't know enough about music to know how to, I don't even know how to tune an instrument. So <laughs> this is a lot of this is over my head. Um, but yeah, it, I can link some of this stuff to you guys because there's some really interesting stuff about just the, the musical aspect and then the, the, there's a whole aspect of, of an interpretation of the public where it's just all about. Uh, the tuning of the difference between the Pythagorean tuning and the just tuning and the ideal state. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's, and I think, like I said, I don't understand the music stuff enough to really to, to talk about it. So I think that these guys <clears throat> being steeped in the, you know, the various ancient mystery schools 
were adept at putting many things into their stuff, whether it was art or writing or whatever. So I, I, I think that, you know, it's people are like, well, I mean, you know, you're finding patterns in the, in the words and there's music, but yes, they, they did this on purpose, multi multiple layers within a, what looks like a single thing. Um, I think that's, that's, that can be well established with brilliant, uh, artists and artisans across the, across the ages. Well, and, and to your point, the the guy, J.B. Kennedy, who found the the 12 note yeah. Pythagorean structure within the Plato dialogues, there's like at least 10 dialogues that in, in antiquity were attributed to Plato, but a lot of modern scholars don't think were his. And in those, he found some of them actually followed that structure and some of them didn't. So he thinks some of them were written by, you know, disciples of Plato's who kept following that structure. Mm. And some of them were written by other people who maybe weren't disciples or didn't know about that. Ah. But it's essentially a way of like, if, if you could find that in anything, test. he would have found that in those, in all of those, those, those other dialogues. Yeah. He didn't find it in all of them. He only found it in some of them. Yeah. Um, so it just is a little bit of an, a further proof to that. Um, so anyways, let's get back to the, <laughs> to the, to the Timaeus. Um, <laughs> So that was just the first sentence where we just said, yeah, one, two, three, where's the fourth? So then Timaeus, he has been taken ill, Socrates, for he would not willingly have been absent from this gathering, Socrates. Then if he is not coming, you and the two others must supply his place, Timaeus. Certainly, and we will do all we can, having been handsomely entertained by you yesterday. Those of us who remain should only too glad to return your hospitality, Socrates. Do you remember what were the points of which I required you to speak? Timaeus, we remember some of them, and you will be here to remind us of anything that we have forgotten, or rather, if we are not troubling you, you will briefly capitu recapitulate the whole, and then the particulars will be more firmly fixed in our memories. Hmm. So he's basically saying, we talked about some stuff yesterday, uh, you want me to go through it again? And Timaeus is like, yeah, you might as well go through it again, because <laughs> we don't necessarily remember it all. <laughs> so Socrates is like, all right, Socrates, to be sure I will. The chief theme of my yesterday's discourse was the state how constituted and of what citizens composed it would seem likely to be most perfect. Timaeus, yes, Socrates, and what you said of it was very much to our mind. Socrates, did we not begin by separating the husbandmen and the artisans from the class of defenders of the state? Yes, Socrates, and when we had given to each one that single employment and particular art which was suited to his nature, we spoke of those who were intended to be our warriors and said that they were to be our guardians of the city against attacks from within as well as from without and to have no other employment. They were to be merciful in judging their subjects of whom they were to be by nature friends, but fierce to their enemies when they came across them in battle. Timaeus, exactly. So this is getting into stuff that it was talked about in the Republic. Yeah. So in the Republic, he talks about, you know, we should make sure everybody does the thing that they're best at. You know, we shouldn't have people doing a bunch of different jobs. We should have people just doing one job and doing really good at it. We should have our, our defenders or essentially our, you know, military be just military and that's all they worry about is being soldiers um yeah he called the guardians the guardians he calls yeah. them the guardians yeah um, yep and then the the leaders of the of the entire thing will be chosen from the guardians from the guardians yeah yep, that's, that's right, right. Yep. and so yeah so then socrates we said if i'm not mistaken that the guardians should be gifted with a temperament in a high degree both of be gifted with a temperament in high degree both passionate and philosophical and that they would be, as they ought to be, gentle to their friends and fierce to their enemies. Timaeus, certainly. To Socrates. And what did we say of their education? Were they not to be trained in gymnastic and music and all the other sorts of knowledge which were proper for them? Timaeus, very true. Socrates. And th being thus trained, they were not to consider gold or silver or anything else to be their own private property. They were to be like hired troops, receiving pay for keeping guard from those who were protected by them, the pay was to be no more than would suffice for men of simple life. They were to spend in common and to live together in the continual practice of virtue, which was to be their sole pursuit. Timaeus, that was also said. So virtuous guardians, that's the, <laughs> that's what we're, <laughs> that's what we're getting at here. <laughs> Socrates, neither did we forget the women of whom we declared that their nature should be assimilated and brought into harmony with those of the men and that common pursuits should be assigned to them both in time of war and in their ordinary life. Timaeus, that again was as you say. Socrates, and what about the procreation of children? Or rather, was not the proposal too singular to be forgotten? For all wives and children were to be in common to the intent that no one should ever know their, his or own child, that they were all to imagine that they were all one family. Those who were within a suitable limit of age were to be brothers and sisters, 
those who are of an elder generation, parents and grandparents, and those of a younger generation, children and grandchildren. Timaeus. Yes, and the proposal is easy to remember, as you say. <laughs> yeah, very, uh, nobody's going to forget something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, this is just, we're kind of just going through, this is recapitulating a lot of stuff that was talked about in Republic. Um, it's, it's relevant, though, because a lot of this stuff plays into the representation of Athens in the story. So, okay. Um, Socrates, <clears throat> and do you also remember how, with a view of securing as far as we could the best breed, we said that a chief magistrates, male and female, should contrive secretly by the use of certain lots to arrange a nuptial meeting that the bad of either sex and the good of either sex might pair with the likewise. And there was to be no quarreling on this account, for they would imagine that the union was a mere accident and was to be attributed to the lot. Timaeus, I remember. Socrates, and you remember how we said that the children of the good parents were to be educated and the children of the bad secretly dispersed among the inferior citizens. And while they were all growing up, all growing up, the rulers were to be on the lookout and to bring up from below in their turn, those who were worthy and those among themselves who were unworthy were to take their places of those who came up. Timaeus, true. Man. So this is like eugenics, which you know <laughs> yeah. we would obviously frown upon nowadays. Um, but in Plato's time, uh, he, I guess it's also probably worth mentioning he was an aristocrat so he you know yeah he was one of the quote-unquote good people <laughs> right who would you know so it it a lot of this is obviously of the time and it's also you know dealing with we're dealing with people who are of the higher class who are writing this stuff and yeah these and he's like yeah yeah uh, you know whenever i hear things like this i always think well who's going to be making all these choices of course that's that's one of the big problems right um, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got to take it a break, like though. a good idea if you think you're one of the good people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're up at a break, so. Time's up, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll come back with more Timaeus after this break. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, history the way you wish it was taught. Here with uh, Tony from the Discord, and we are going through uh, uh, the Timaeus dialogues, Plato and Socrates, and eventually I hope we're going to be looking at Atlantis and Bronze Age stuff. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> we're getting there. All right. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, we just got done basically recapitulating the Republic. And then Socrates says, then I have now, <clears throat> then have I now given you all the heads of yesterday's discussion? Or is there anything more, my dear Timaeus, which has been omitted? Timaeus, nothing, Socrates. It was just as you have said. So if anybody has ever read, read uh, the Republic before, you'll realize there actually was a fairly substantial part of that dialogue that was missing from that recapitulation, which was the philosopher king um, in the yeah. Republic. Plato's ideal state, the whole thing was led by, you know, what Plato calls the philosopher king, which would be this leader who is trained in philosophy and knows virtue and stuff like that. The fact that that was completely left out of the recapitulation of Republic, again, to me, sort of implies that Plato's thinking on this stuff has evolved and that this isn't necessarily a direct continuation of the Republic, but that's, this is sort of a break. And he's saying, this is, this is new stuff. Um, if, if it was a continuation, he wouldn't have left out the philosopher king. Okay. Um, so I don't know. That, that's just again. It just goes back to that one, two, three being like a you know this is a break from from the Republic. Just because a lot of times when you see Platonic dialogues grouped, you'll see the Republic, Timaeus and Critias grouped together, mm. and I just don't think that that's the correct grouping of the dialogue. Okay. Well, I I don't know much about this at all, but I mean, is the missing four that part? Like, he's like, hey, one, two, three, wait, where's the fourth one? Uh, I guess it's not here. Is that? That that certainly could be, he could be referring to that, yeah. Oh. Uh, I, I guess I I hadn't thought of that, to be perfectly honest with you, <laughs> but that's not, that's a pretty good suggestion. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and, I mean, I, you know, I the missing four could be a lot of different things. It could be multiple things, and it certainly could be that as well. Um, yeah. But and, yeah, there's like, 
it, it, is the the idea of this philosopher king like is this um is this maybe a pharaonic kind of thing isn't that what the pharaohs were supposed to be like they were supposed to be initiated into the mysteries and sort of uh very virtuous and godlike or whatever in their in their hearts way weighing of the heart you know like is that is do you think that's what he's getting that from it, it, again it's it's possible he is i mean a lot of people seem to think he's like envisioning socrates as the philosopher king mm. um but i mean no you're right you're absolutely right that he and he certainly viewed uh egypt in that way like, yeah as this like sort of static society that didn't change right and he he viewed that unchangingness actually as a as a virtue so to speak like because mm. i think he, he thought change led to disintegration essentially um mm. so yeah i know those are all uh, excellent suggestions as far as what that it, the thing is the something has changed though right so right like his 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 thinking has evolved from where the republic was and so that this is this is kind of a new thing he's doing here um anyways that's my take on that okay so then uh socrates i should like before proceeding further to tell you how i feel about the state which we have described i might compare myself to a person who on beholding a beautiful animal is either created by the painter's art or better still alive but at rest is seized with the desire of seeing them in motion or engaged in some struggle or conflict to which their forms appear suited. This is my feeling about the state which we have been describing. There are conflicts which all cities undergo, and I should like to hear someone tell of our own city carrying on such a struggle against her neighbors and how she went out to war in a becoming manner. And when at war, showed by her greatness of her actions and the magnanimity of her words in dealing with other cities, a result worthy of her training and education. Hmm. Now, I, Critias and Hermocratus, am conscious that I myself should never be able to celebrate the city and her citizens in a befitting manner, and I am not surprised at my own incapacity. To me, the wonder is rather that the poets present as well as past are no, that the poets present as well as past are no better, not that I mean to deprecate them, but everyone can see that they are a tribe of imitators and will imitate best and most easily, easily the life in which they have been brought up. Well, that which is beyond the range of a man's education, he finds hard to carry on in action and still harder adequately to represent in language. I'm aware that the sophists have plenty of brave words and fair conceits, but I'm afraid that only being wanderers from one city to another and having never had habitations of their own, they may fail in their conception of philosophers and statesmen and may not know what, <clears throat> what they do and say in time of war when they are fighting or holding parley with their enemies. And thus people of your class are, only, are the only ones remaining who are fitted by nature and education to take part at once in both politics and philosophy. Hmm. So it's probably worth talking about who Critias and Hermocratus are at this point, and then who Timaeus may or may not be. Critias is uh, related to Socrates. It's some sometimes it's because there's different there's multiple Critias's. Uh, Critias had a or Plato had a cousin Critias who was uh, af after after. <clears throat> so we had mentioned earlier. I'm already like interrupting myself. No problem. We mentioned earlier there was uh, <laughs> after the the Persian War. Athens set up this sort of like defense league. After a while, this defense league that Athens set up became essentially like a protection racket. And they just milked this thing for money for themselves. Eventually, all of the people, a lot of the people who were involved in this defense league got sick of it and they went to Sparta and were like, hey, put a stop to this. This eventually, this is kind of a, a super kind of basic summarization of how the Peloponnesian War started. There's certainly a lot more to, that, that, to it than that. But the Peloponnesian War went from like 430 to about 404 BC. So during Plato's first, you know, 15, 20 years of his life, and it was this war between Athens and Sparta. Sparta won, and when they won, they installed like their own rulers in Athens. And this was the tyranny of the 30 is what it's known as. Hmm. Plato's cousin Critias was one of these 30. He was one of like the leaders of this 30. Huh. This is not the Critias of the dialogue, though. The Critias of the dialogue was that person's grandfather okay that critias of the dialogue also has a grandfather critias though so there's <laughs> there's a lot of critiases <laughs> just but so sometimes you'll see stuff where people think like this critias is the the critias of the 30 tyrants and it's just i at it so anyways this critias though is a is a is essentially it's like a a, a relative of plato's an elder relative of plato's who was like a athenian statesman okay Hermocratus, so during this Peloponnesian War, uh, Athens, for some reason, during the during a, a war against Sparta, 
they decided they were going to try to invade Sicily. I don't know why. It seems crazy, <laughs> but they did. Hermocratus was uh, the Sicilian who organized the resistance to the Athenian invasion. Hmm. And he didn't like Athens very much at all. He kind of thought they were replacing the Persian Empire. So, it, so it, it's fairly interesting that this character is included in this dialogue. Um, you know, he, he certainly has like a lot of knowledge about like statesmanship and war, which is basically what play, uh, Socrates is talking about wanting to have him involved. But, you know, this, the fact that there's this member of this resistance to Athenian invasion who's part of this dialogue, it's just, it's, it's kind of interesting. Okay. Timaeus himself, uh, there's not necessarily a record of him existing. It's possible he did, but most people seem to think Timaeus was like a uh, composite of multiple people probably different Pythagorean philosophers that, that Plato knew. Um, so, you know, the, the one that most is commonly cited is uh, Philoeus of Croton, who wrote a book that people think Plato plagiarized for a lot of the material in the Timaeus. Hmm. It seems like the, the, it seems like the, uh, the Critias in the, in the previous Hermocratus. slide, Hermocratus are the same character they're similar because it says I, Critias and Hermocrates, yeah. am blah 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 blah. Like he's speaking of both of them as one person. That's true. Well, this is Socrates talking. Oh, he's speaking to he them. He says now I, Critias and Hermocrates. He's and talking just, to them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They, in the dialogue, they'll actually they have their own things that they say too. So they. Okay, I got you. I got you. Okay. The, yeah. the way the sentence was structured, I'm like, okay, that's nope. two yeah, people, that's two names for one guy. <laughs> yep, that, that's fine. Um, uh, so, anyways, um, but but I think this this thing with with plagiarization, I, I think, like in the in a, in a lot of the later dialogues, Socrates isn't the main character; it's other people, and I think what Plato's doing is, like, letting other people's ideas. You know, he's giving voice to other people's ideas. Right. So okay. in this case, he might be using a composite because it's multiple people's ideas. He's compiling into maybe one sort of thought. Yeah. And so he doesn't maybe he just makes a composite character of those people. Yeah. But there's other dialogues that are part of his later dialogues where there's specific people who are actual people. And they have like, you know, very long speeches in these these later dialogues. And to me, it seems like what he's really doing is Plato's allowing those people to kind of their voices to come through in his dialogues, essentially. Um, at least that's what I get out of that. So the watcher, the watcher is posting some interesting stuff here. He says, Timaeus is the Greek version of the Latin Timaeus or to honor, uh, to estimate, fix the value or to honor, to have an honor, to revere or venerate are the definitions. That, yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, that, yeah, I actually didn't know that, but that's, that would seem to fit in pretty well with the idea of honoring the ideas of other people. Yep, that's true. Um, yeah, no, that's that's super interesting. I probably should have looked up that word. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here and do your, do your, do your no, research. No, that's what the watcher's for, That's right, right. yeah, that's, that's totally that's what, what he, he's here. That is exactly what he's here for, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the dialogue. <clears throat> here is Timaeus, the Locris, or <clears throat> here's Timaeus of Locris in Italy, a city which has admiral laws, which has admirable laws and who is himself in wealth and rank of the equal of any of his fellow citizens. He has held the most important and honorable offices in his own state. And as I believe has scaled the heights of all philosophy. And here is Critias, whom every Athenian knows to be no novice in the matters which we are speaking. And as to Hermocratus, I am assured by many witnesses that his genius and education qualify him to take part in any speculation of the kind. And therefore, Yesterday, when I saw that you wanted me to describe the formation of the state, I readily assented, being very well aware that if you would only, none were better suited, none were better qualified to carry on the discussion further, and that when you had engaged our city in a suitable war, you of all men living could best exhibit her playing a fitting part. When I had completed my task, I in return imposed this other task upon you. You conferred together and agreed to entertain me today, as I had entertained you with a feast of discourse. Here I am in a festive array, and no man could be more ready for the promised banquet. <laughs> yeah. This just makes me think, I put it on the title, this makes me think of Nirvana, here I am now, entertain me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what he's saying. He's like, I entertained you yesterday, you agreed to yep. entertain me today, here I am, lay it on me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then Hermocrates, and we too, Socrates, as Timaeus says, will not be wanting in enthusiasm, and there is no excuse for not complying with your request. As soon as we arrived yesterday at the guest chamber of Critias, and with whom we are staying, or rather on whom, or rather on our way thither, we talked the matter over, 
and we told us an ancient tradition, which I wish, Critias, that you would repeat to Socrates, so that he, he may help us to judge whether it will satisfy his requirements or not. Hmm. I will, Timaeus. I will, if Timaeus, who is our other partner, approves. Hmm. Timaeus, I quite approve. Cool. Okay, so here's where we get to Critias launching into the story of Atlantis. Right. And so he just he just set it up like, okay, we were talking about this earlier. And I think this is the maybe this matches the thing that you were wanting us to, you know, yeah, the, the, yep. the idealized state. So we talked state. about the ideal state. I want to see the ideal state in action. Yeah. And then they're like, hey, we were talking about the story that might fit what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then Critias. Then listen, Socrates, to a tale which, though strange, is certainly true, having been attested by Salon, who is the wisest of the seven sages. He was a relative and a dear friend of my great-grandfather, Dropides, as he himself says in many passages of his poems. And he told the story to Critias, my grandfather, who remembered and repeated it to us. There were of old, he said, great and marvelous actions of the Athenian city, which have passed into oblivion through lapse of time and the destruction of mankind, and one particular greater than all the rest. This we will now rehearse. It will be a fitting moment to our gratitude. It will be a fitting monument to our gratitude to you and a hymn of praise true and worthy of the goddess on this her festival day. Socrates, very good. And what is this ancient famous action of the Athenians which Critias declared on the authority of Salon to be not a mere legend, but an actual fact. <laughs> so we'll get back to the whole not a mere legend, actual fact and authenticity part of it, because Plato gets back to this later in the dialogue. Uh, but at this point, we should maybe just talk a little bit about Salon. So Salon is a relative of Plato's as well, um, and a relative of Critias, as Critias points out. Um, he was born uh, around 630 BC, so like 200 years before Plato was born. And then they, he's referred to as one of the seven sages. The seven sages are kind of like, in a way, they're like the seven wonders of the world. Yeah, they're mythical author figures. Of the time has their own version of who the seven sages are. <laughs> you know, so it's not like a necessarily a firm group, but Salon, as far as I know, was like a member of all of the different versions of the seven sages. So mm. he's like one of the, the big members of it. Um, in, in like around 594, he in, instituted a series of political reforms essentially wrote a bunch of laws and then he got out of town for like 10 years so that nobody could like tell him to change them. So he's essentially <laughs> like, here's my laws. You guys got to follow these. I'm out. <laughs> so when he left, he went to Egypt, he went to Cyprus, he went to Lydia, he went like all over the place, traveled. He was a statesman. So, you know, the, the Egyptians were friendly with the Greeks at the time. So, you know, he was entertained, uh, went to a bunch of places and then he came back to Athens and then there was, uh, Plato mentions this again. There was, you know, stuff that happened, but essentially that's that's Salon, right? He was this famous Athenian statesman, went to Egypt, brought some stuff back. So, uh, yeah, all right. So then we'll get back to Critias. I will tell an old world story, which I had heard from an old man, for Critias at the time of telling it was, as he said, nearly 90 years of age, and I was 10. Now the day that, now the day was the day of the epic, Apaturia, which is called the registration of youth, at which, according to custom, our parents gave prizes for recitations, and the poems of several poets were recited by us boys, and many of us sang the poems of Salon, which at the time had not gone out of fashion. One of our tribe, either because he thought so or to please Critias, said that in his judgment Salon was not only the wisest of men, but also the noblest of poets. The old man, as I very well remember, brightened up at hearing this and said, smiling, Yes, Sammy Nander, if Salon only if only Salon had, like other poets, made poetry the business of his life and had completed the tale which he brought with him from Egypt and had not been compelled by reason of the factions and troubles which he found stirring in his own country when he came home to attend to other matters, in my opinion, he would have been as famous as Homer or Hesiod or any poet. And what is the tale, Critias, said Annie Mander? So one thing real quick, he says right at the bat, he's like, uh, I heard it when I was 10 and my grandfather Critias was 90 at the time. Yeah. A lot of people will latch onto this and talk about Atlantis as being this like game of telephone where Salon told it to Dropidus, Dropidus told it to Critias, Critias told it to Critias, Critias told it to Plato. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. But they were, they were awarded prizes for how well they could recite the tales. That was the other thing about oh, it. Right. So, yeah. okay. That's a very good point. And I'll get back to that. Cause that's, you're exactly right. But in Critias, the, the dialogue Critias, uh, Plato adds details to this story. So I'll just read a little bit from Critias right now. Yet, before proceeding further in the narrative, I ought to warn you that you must not be surprised if you should perhaps hear Hellenic names given to foreigners, 
I will tell you the reason of this. Solano, who is in Salon, <laughs> who is intending to use the tale for his poem, inquired into the meaning of the names and found that the early Egyptians in writing them down had translated them into their own language and recovered the meaning of several names and when a copying them out again, translated them into our language. Hmm. My great grandfather Dropidus had the original writing, which is still in my possession and was carefully studied by me when I was a child. Therefore, if you hear names such as used in this country, you must not be surprised for I've told you how they came to be introduced. Huh, that's so cool. in Critias, he's saying essentially the tale, the transmission goes from Salon writing it down to Critias reading it. <laughs> yeah. That's the entire transmission right there. There is no game of telephone or anything like that. Ah, so, right. And it kind of but, says that here too, because they're basically implying that he was a great poet and he started to write this tale down and maybe he didn't finish it because there was a whole bunch of other crap going on that he had to handle, right? Is that, yeah. that's kind of what they're saying here too and that's what you're showing. That's right. Well, and but, but like Kyle pointed out, uh, remembering poetry was a thing Yes. Aristocratic young Athenians did at the time. Right. right? Like when I first they could all recite Homer and Hesiod off the top of their heads. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> when I first so, read that passage, I was like, dude, this is yeah, I, I want to teach this to my kids. Like, okay, you gotta learn this poem. Yeah. And you get prizes for reciting it. Yeah, perfectly. now recite that's, it for me. That's awesome. Bring me wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great yeah. thing. I mean, I guess we did that in, in school when we were in theater, you know, but. Yeah. But no, yeah, it, it's just, I just, a lot of people, like, especially when I talk to, on Twitter to scripts about this, they'll write to be like, well, it was this whole long chain. And it's like, well, not really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's a good point. <laughs> good point. Um, okay. So. To just, so we're, we're kind of like keeping track of what's going on. And what was this tale about Critias and Animander? So right now what's happening in the, in the actual story is Critias is telling a story about his grandfather Critias telling a story about Salon being told a story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well done. So there's, there's <laughs> stories within stories within stories that are happening in the dialogue right here. And that's actually something Plato does all the time as well. He like, the Protagoras dialogue is actually, it starts off with play, uh, with Socrates running into like an unnamed friend and the friend is like, hey, what's going on? And Socrates is like, oh, I just came from, Protagoras, uh, from this guy's house and I talked to Protagoras and this is what happened. And then he goes on to recall the entire dialogue that he just had. Hmm. So the premise of that whole dialogue is that Socrates is retelling it <laughs> yeah. to somebody else. So this is like, Plato plays with this kind of stuff all the time in his dialogues where he's like, nesting stories within stories and stuff so I, yeah I it seems interesting that like why wouldn't you just write it down as plato you know as socrates talking to pythagoras instead of i mean it's just it's just a strange thing i, I you know I, yeah. I get what you're saying but yeah he's like i'm going to write this down but instead of having it be the actual dialogue between the two men i'm going to have one of the men tell a story to another random guy about <laughs> that dialogue it's, exactly yes, it's interesting yes. yeah yeah, and that, but that's totally a thing Plato does all the time. So okay. it's not like necessarily out of out of character, character yeah. or anything like that. Okay. Okay, so, and what was this tale about, Critias, said Animander? About the greatest actions which the Athenians ever did, and which ought to have been the most famous, but through the lapse of time and the destruction of the actors, it has not come down to us. Tell us, said the other, the whole story, and how and from whom Salon heard this veritable tradition. He replied, in the Egyptian Delta, at the head of which the river Nile divides, there is a certain district, which is called the District of Size, and the great city of that district is also called Size, and this is and, it, and is the city from which King Amasis came. The citizens have a deity for their foundress, and she is called in the Athe Egyptian tongue Nath, and she is assented, asserted by them to be the same whom the Hellenes call Athene. They are great lovers of the Athenians and say that they are in some way related to them. To this city came Salon, and was received there with great honor. He asked the priests who were most skillful in such manners about antiquity and made the discovery that neither he nor any other Hellene knew anything worth mentioning about the times of old. So. <laughs> Watcher, dude. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> it's just a tribute. Um, <laughs> so, yep. so one thing too, I wanted to mention um, back to the, just the poem thing real quick. Uh, in Critias, uh, Salon introduces that story as an epic poem in a way. 
I'm sorry, not Slum, uh, Plato. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm mixing up my names. Um, so here, I just want to go through a, a couple of things here real quick. So the opening lines of some plays, opening lines of Works and Days by Hesiod. Muses of Pereira, who give glory through song, come hither and tell of Zeus, your father, and chant his praise. So the opening line from Theogony. From the Heliconine Muses, let us sing, let us begin to sing, who held the great and holy Mount of Helicon. The opening line of Iliad. Sing, O goddess, the anger of Achilles, son of Peles. The opening line of Odysseus, or of, of the Odyssey. Tell me, O muse, of that ingenious, ingenious hero who traveled far and wide. Mm. So as yeah. you can see right away what they're doing is they're invoking the muses right at the beginning of these, these poems. Yeah. Uh, at the, not right, right at the beginning, but towards the beginning of Critias, uh, Plato does a similar thing. Uh, he has Socrates say, friend Hermocrates, you, who, or no, I'm sorry, Critias says this. Friend Hermocrates, you who are stationed last and have another in front of you have not lost heart yet. The gravity of the situation will soon be revealed to you. Meanwhile, I accept your exhortations and encouragements. But besides the goddess, gods and goddesses whom I have mentioned, I would specifically invoke Memzoni for all the important part of my discourse is dependent on her favor. Okay. And if I can recollect and recite enough of what was said by the priests and brought hither by Salon, I no doubt shall satisfy, satisfy the requirements. So Menosomi, I'm sure I'm butchering that, is the muse of memory. Ah, okay. So he's basically saying he's 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 invoking a muse to help remember him help him remember the story. But it to me it like it he's ba it's like Plato kind of letting people know, you know, I'm invoking a muse. This might be thought of as an epic poem, maybe. Yeah, and it's also yes, which, it's it's also which isn't a, the dialogue we're reading right now, but I'm sorry. Yeah, and it's also a kind of <clears throat> a formal beginning to one of these tales, right? Yes, they they exactly. sort of, it's, yep. this is how, you know, this, this lets you know, here is a, a, a you know, like it, sort of like how we say, you know, a long time ago, far, you know, far, far away or whatever. It's, it's yep. sort of a formal beginning to this tale and letting you know that here is a true tale that has been handed down and remains true. So that's cool. Um, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it, it definitely like, he, he's certainly, and that, that comes from Critias and he, but he's certainly trying to frame the Critias. It seems like as his own version of that epic poem, yeah. it's like, this is my epic poem. Right. Um, so, okay. So back to, uh, this is the, the priest talking now, the Egyptian priest. Um, well, no, okay. I'm sorry. This is not the Egyptian priest. Um, yeah, okay, I'll just read the sentence again. To this city came Salon, and he was received there with great honor. He asked the priests who were most skillful in such matters about antiquity and made the discovery that neither he nor any Hellene knew anything worth mentioning about the times of old. <laughs> On one occasion, wishing to draw them out to speak of antiquity, he began to tell them about the most ancient things in our part of the world, about Phoranus, who is called the first man, about Niobe, and after the deluge of the survival of Decalion and Phyra, and he traced the genealogy of their descendants and reckoning up the dates, try to compute how many years ago the events of which he was speaking happened. Thereupon, one of the priests, who is of a very great age, said, O oh, Salon, Salon, you Hellenes are never anything but children, and there is not an old man among you. Salon in return asked him what he meant. I mean to say, he replied, that in mind you are all young. There is no old opinion handed down to you by the ancient tradition, nor any science which is hoary with age. And I will tell you why. There have been, and will be again, many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water, and the leather lesser ones by innumerable, innumerable other causes. There is a story, which even you have preserved, that once upon a time Phaeton, the son of Helios, having yoked the steeds in his father's chariot, because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father, burnt up all that was upon the earth, and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Mm. So I know in, in Cosmographia, Randall spent some time talking about yes. uh, the myth of Phaeton. So I'll just go over it real quickly again. The basic story is uh, Helios is the sun god. Uh, his son, Thetan, asks him if he can drive the chariot of the sun through the heavens. Helios says, okay. Uh, Thetan does and loses control of it, burns up the earth. And then Zeus, in order to stop it, hits him with a thunderbolt and he crashes down to, to earth uh, as a space rock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, kind of my favorite part of that story is the... It's a classic sort of like his father's like, I'll give you anything you ask. Ask me. And he's like, I want to drive your chariot. And he's like, anything but that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I summarize it way too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot more to it. But essentially, it's it's 
you know, and, and the, the, the Egyptian priest right there, Plato is right there being like, this is presented as a myth, but it's a real story. Yes, that's right. Um, the other thing he mentioned, the other story that was mentioned in that passage that comes up again in the, the Atlantis dialogue is the story of Deucalion. So it's probably just worth mentioning that briefly. So that's essentially the Greek flood myth. Um, and I'll read uh, like a synopsis of that story. This actually comes from an appendix in the book, The Search for Atlantis, which was written by an academic named Steve Kershaw. Okay. But this is just about the Deucalion myth. So in the Greek tradition, Apollodorus says that Prometheus had a son called Deucalion who married Phyra, the daughter of Epimetheus and Pandora. In this version, rather than letting the bronze race men destroy themselves as they do in Hesiod, Zeus decides to eradicate them by means of a deluge. Deucalion takes his father's advice, builds a chest, stocks it with provisions, and embarks on it with Phyra. Zeus's torrential rain floods most of Greece and overwhelms everywhere outside the Isthmus of Corinth and the Peloponnese, destroying everyone except the, flu the few who fled to the mountains. Deucalion floated in his chest for nine days and nights, and when the rain finally abated, he made landfall on Mount Parnassus. He sacrificed to Zeus, who sent Hermes to grant him whatever he wished. Deucalion chose to make humans, which he and Pyra did by taking stones and tossing them over their heads. The stones became men, hers became women. Hmm. So that's the like mythical <clears throat> version of the story of Deucalion. There's a different version. Are you guys familiar with the Parian marble? No. Nope. So this is a, it's a, it's a sculpture, which essentially just has a, a list of events. Okay. Uh, it was the, it's, it was discovered in parts. The first part of it was found in like the 1600s. And then the other part of it was found in like the 1800s. So it was highly likely to have been forged because if somebody had forged it in the 1600s, they wouldn't have probably left the other piece of it. Oh, you know, I don't know. Anyways, so, <laughs> but it's a sculpture that has just like all these, like, it's just a list of events right. from like Athenian history. So some scholars actually think it could possibly the sort, the original source of this could possibly be like the, the, the archives of Athens. Okay. Just because the, the entries are just very like, they're, they're not like mythological at all. They're just kind of very mundane stuff. So the fourth entry in that, in the Parian marble deals with the flood of Deucalion. So I'm just going to read the first four entries, just to kind of give you a feel for this. And then the fourth one is the, the one we're, we're talking about. All right. So number one, from the time Cecrops became king of Athens, hence a land formerly called Attica, from Atticus, born from the earth, was called Cecropia, 1,318 years. Two, from the time Deucalion became king of Mount Parnassus in Lycoria, when Cecrops was king of Athens, 1,310 years. Three, from the time a trial occurred in Athens between Ares and Poseidon over Halorotheus, Poseidon's son, hence the place was called Eripagos, 1,268 years, when Cranius was king of Athens. Four, from the time a flood occurred in Deucalion's days, and Deucalion escaped the waters from Lycoria to Athens towards dot, 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 because it's that part of the sculpture is erased, and established the Temple of Zeus and made sacrifices of deliverance. 1,265 years. Of course. Cranus was king of Athens. So the, the years are like years ago from when the, the, the thing was sculpted, but that's a completely different version of the, 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 the Deucalion flood myth. Yeah, so and of course version, where he went is missing. Yeah. Well, yeah, God. in that version, he escapes to Athens. So clearly not all of Greece was underwater if Deucalion escaped to Athens to survive the flood. Yeah. So just <laughs> this isn't necessarily a story about the flood, the, the Deucalion myth or anything, but it's, it's the Deucalion thing is kind of it plays a role in the story of Atlantis. And I just think that's interesting. The, the two completely different versions of that story. Yeah. Um, but so, again, is, isn't we've talked about this, too, that. And you've pointed out with Critias and Critias and Critias and Critias that like they, these people name themselves the same thing. So could these be two different Deucalions? Possibly. Possibly. I mean, Deucalion in like for for the Greeks is like Utapishnu or, or Noah. So, okay. I mean, it could be a yeah, so, Deucalion, but more than likely it's the original version. All right. Um, okay. So back to the story. He had just got done describing the, the, the Phaeton thing. Now, this has the form of a myth. The Phaeton thing has the form of a myth, but it really signifies a declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth and a great conflagration of things upon the earth, which recurs after long intervals. At such times, those who live upon the mountains and in dry and lofty places are more liable to destruction than those who dwell by rivers or on the seashore. 
And from this calamity, the Nile, who is our never failing savior, delivers and preserves us. When on the other hand, the gods purge the earth with a deluge of water, the survivors in your country are herdsmen and shepherds who dwell in the mountains. But those who, like you, live in cities are carried by the rivers into the sea. Whereas in this land, neither then nor at any other time does the water come down from above on the fields, having always a tendency to come up from below, for which reason the traditions preserved here are the most ancient. The fact is that wherever the extremity of winter frost or of summer does not prevent, mankind exist, sometimes in greater, sometimes in lesser numbers. And whatever happened either in your country or in ours or in any other region of which we are informed, if there were any actions, noble or great, or in any other way remarkable, they have been written down by us. <clears throat> they have been written down by us of old and are preserved in our temples. Yeah, interesting that he's so, saying the water comes up from below. Yeah, subglacial floods. <laughs> well, the other thing that's interesting about that line is that he says the water doesn't come from above. Yeah, in our place is what he's saying, though, right? Well, in in Egypt. Yes, in Egypt. In so Egypt, that, it tends to come up to from me, below. Yeah, that to me implies that if Robert Shock is right. This happened after that. Ah, uh, okay. I see what you mean. Because there's no water coming from above. According to this priest and their history, they have no history of water coming from above. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, we need that's, to take, just, that's a good point. No, <laughs> good point. Yeah. We need, um, we, need, we need to take another break, though. But this is great. Sounds good. This is a good part, point for it. Yeah. This is great. <laughs> All right. We'll be back, folks, with more uh, Snake Tales <laughs> and Atlantis. <Woo! laughs> Fuzzy, due to consumption of the Wolf Hollow Brewing Company Brew Pasture beers. <laughs> My first was the the Fall Tree Oktoberfest Oktoberfest style ale. Polish that one off. Polish that one off. <laughs> Warm and fuzzy, and uh, trying this El Lobo Loco Mexican style lager. All right, I'm drinking an Indeed Day Tripper. Ah, wow. It's nighttime. It is a local Minnesota brewery. Cool. Uh, okay. <laughs> Heck yeah. Well, these are fantastic beers, Brew Pastor. Appreciate it, sir. <laughs> ah, very nice. Yeah, I don't have the the direct link to the Brew Pastor beers. So yeah. I'm gonna slum it with these Minnesota beers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are we going? All right, so uh, we just got done. I'll I'll just wrap up the last sentence I just last I just said, and then we'll we'll keep going. So, and whatever happened either in your country or in ours or in any other region of which we are informed, if there were any actions noble or great or in any way other remarkable, they have been written down by us of old and are preserved in our temples. <clears throat> Whereas just when you and other nations are beginning to be provided with letters and the other prerequisites of civil, civilized life, and after the usual interval. The stream from heaven, like a pestilence, comes pouring down and leaves only those of you who are destitute of letters and education. And so you have to begin again all over like children and know nothing of what happened in ancient times, either among us or among yourselves. As for those genealogies of yours, which you just now recounted to us, Salon, they are no better than the tales of children. In the first place, you remember a single deluge only, but there were many previous ones. In the next place, you do not know that there formerly dwelt in your land the fairest and noblest race of men which ever lived, and that you and your whole city are descended from a small seed or remnant of which them of them which survived. And this was unknown to you because for many generations, the survivors of that destruction died, leaving no written word. For there was a time, Salon, before the great deluge of all, when the city which now is Athens was first in war and in every way the best governed of all cities, is said to have preferred, is said to have performed the noblest deeds and to have had the fairest constitution of any which tradition tells under the face of heaven. Solon marveled at his words and earnestly requested the priest to inform him exactly and in order about these former citizens. So uh, are we, since we were looking at the beginning and we now know, you know, that, that the whole setup for this was 
these guys, these guests of Socrates are now to entertain him. And Socrates' requirement is that he wants to hear a story about the ideal state doing something, going to war. Is that what that's, do you think that that's being inserted into this story? I mean, that the, you know, that we're having, we're being told something like a myth that has the form of a myth, but that all that stuff about how, you know, the Egyptians are like, yeah, yeah, yeah they were the best of men and everything was awesome. And they basically had a, they, they, everything they did was amazing. Is that being inserted for Socrates' benefit in this tale to set it up? So that, that's, yes, that's a question, right? Like, yeah. certainly Plato's like, doing philosophy in these dialogues. Yeah. Even if he's, even if like, I think there actually is a story from Salon that he's writing about. Yeah. But, but even if that's true, he's still like doing philosophy. Right. So, I, but I don't know that it's any different than what people today do when they're talking about ancient civilizations. I mean, the, we, we run up a, uh, on this all the time with people like, Oh yeah, they, they lived in harmony. They were at one with the earth and the plants and the trees <laughs> and right. the grasses and the birds and the, the <laughs> You know, and it's like they have this, there's your ideal state in the minds of modern people thinking of people in the past. Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, so it's possible that that's just a thing that we do. Yep. Yeah. No, I mean, but those, that's, that, that's, I mean, that's, that's like the questions, right? Though, like, that's kind of the stuff I'm interested in, right? Is yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. Like, what part of this is, Plato's additions, the things he's adding for his own reasons, what parts of it are original, you know, yeah, like yeah. these are, these are the, like the questions I'm interested in about the story, just because well, like, it certainly seems like to me, at least he wouldn't have received a story from Salon that exactly fit what he's trying to do. Right. So he's, he's trying to, to work it into what he's trying to do. Yeah. That's or, just my take on I it. mean, it could be that the story really was passed down that they had this awesome system of government and it was all great and so he's like hey here's a story that might fit yeah and that's that's, that's totally possible too but yeah. I, I would just like to point out on the other side that there's no reason to put in all of this stuff about fire from heaven and waters coming up from the earth and the many destructions of of mankind and the uh, the seed that became uh you know the greeks or whatever like, what does that have to do with the ideal state? It doesn't have anything to do with it. So it's interesting. That's a very good point, Kyle. And we will yeah. definitely be getting back to that point. <laughs> okay. Awesome. <laughs> Jump in the gun. All right. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. That's actually an excellent point. Okay. So we uh, we just got done. Salon marveled at his words, and he wants the priest to inform him about the deeds. You are welcome to hear about them, Salon, said the priest, for both for your sake and for that of your city, and above all, for the sake of the goddess who is the common patron and parent and educator of both our cities. She founded your city a thousand years before ours, receiving from the earth and Hephaestus the seed of your race, and afterwards she founded ours, of which the constitution is recorded in our sacred registers to be 8,000 years old. As touching your citizens of 9,000 years ago, I will briefly inform you of their laws and of their most famous action. The exact particulars of the whole we will thereafter go through at our own leisure in the sacred registers themselves. So <clears throat> just real quick, the 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 part about um, there, there's one thing here first, which is he's he's uh, he says that the constitution and our sacred registers to be 8000 years old. One common misunderstanding about the the Atlanta story is people will often think that Plato says Egypt was founded 8,000 years ago. But the way I read this is he's saying, um, would you say Sias or Sais? Yes, Sais. Sais? Yeah. The way I read it is he's saying Sais was founded 8,000 years ago. Because he's specifically talking about she founded your city. A thousand years before ours, yeah. And then she founded ours. Yeah. Yes. So – a lot, I don't know. I see a lot of people saying, well, he, he, Plato says Egypt was founded after Athens and this thing. And it, to me, I'm, I'm not, I don't read it that way. I read it as he's saying that, that Sais was founded after Athens. Yeah. That particular um, city is 8,000 yes. years old and, they, and their city is a thousand years older than that. So 9,000 years. Yeah. That makes sense to me. I see that. In addition to that, Plato himself in other works in a, a dialogue he wrote called Laws talks about Egypt being more than 10,000 years old. Yeah. Uh, Egypt itself, not Sais. So, right. 
uh, you know, because he talks about like their art staying the same for like a you know vast period of time or whatever. So, he, you know, he was aware of of how old Egypt thought it was or whatever. And so, again, this to me, this is he's saying like Saïs is eight thousand years old and not not Egypt itself, yeah, which would be older than Saïs then. Um, the other thing with respect to this is, so we'll get into this right now. Uh, there's a guy a guy named Proclus. Uh, Proclus, I'm probably mispronouncing that. He lived in the fifth century AD. So this would be 800 years after Plato's time. Uh, he was like one of the last uh, uh, heads of the Platonic Academy, or I don't even know if the Academy was around then. He was one of the last like Neoplatonists around during, during Roman times. But he wrote a whole uh, commentary on Timaeus. And in his commentary, he kind of went through like all of like the past opinions of other philosophers on the Atlantis story. So I'm just going to read the first paragraph from that because it is relevant to this, this point here. So with respect to the whole of this narration about the Atlantics, some say that it is a mere history, which was the opinion of Cranter, the first interpreter of Plato, who says that Plato was derided by those of his time as not being the inventor of the Republic, but transcribing what the Egyptians had written on the subject and that he so far regards what was said by these deriders as to refer to the Egyptians this history about the Athenians and Atlantics, and to believe that the Athenians once lived comfortably to this polity. Cranter adds that this is testified by the prophets of the Egyptians, who assert that these particulars were written on pillars which are still preserved. Oh, man. So this is kind of like a, a lot of people will quote this as like a, uh, as proof that the story, the Atlantis story is true, and it may well be that. The thing I find interesting is the idea that Plato was essentially mocked for getting his ideas about the ideal state from Egypt. Yeah. Um, and then to me, that seems like, and this doesn't prove anything, obviously, but the making Athens older than Sais in here might be Plato's way of saying, no way, man, like we had our laws before Egypt did. Egypt got their laws from us. Don't make fun of me for taking stuff from Egypt because Egypt got it from us. <laughs> and even, even regardless of that, we both got them from Athena. So yeah. if you're making fun of me, you're making fun of Athena. And yeah. I don't think you want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are good points. I, I really like the parts in here where, you know, the, the priest here is saying, the exact particulars of this we will hereafter go through at our leisure in the sacred registers themselves. In other words, that's implying that the priest later, after telling, after giving Soul on this story, you know, by talking about it, he's like, but after we're done, after I'm done telling you this, let's go down into the library and I'll yeah. show you the actual writings. We'll uncover the pillar. That's right. <laughs> you know, well, no, and that's, and then that's I, like the, the part I read about Critias earlier where Salon is transcribing the names. Yeah. And that's what he's doing that from. He would have been doing that from the original writings, right? Like yeah. he wouldn't be transcribing the names from person talking to him yeah that's right <laughs> so yeah no i mean yeah exactly right like that there clearly was you know salon saw stuff and whether he translated or like the egyptian priest helped him with translation like you know he wrote it down from the source material more than likely that seems to be what the the what what plato's saying here yeah and it's also um, another point i think just on this on these dates this these years uh to me, and there, there's nothing that you can point to in the text that says this specifically, but it seems obvious to me what you were saying that the eight thousand years old is just that city because how else would they have a, th how else would they have recorded uh, information Actions from before them? Yes, yes that, exactly. Yes. If that was supposed to be the founding of Egypt, well, then they wouldn't have any records, you know, of of something a thousand years older than that. So their civilization must predate that the founding of that city. So I agree with you on that. That's yeah. interesting. Um, okay. So if you compare these very laws with ours, you will find that many of ours are the counterpart of yours as they, as they were in the olden time. In the first place, there's the cast of priests, which is separated from all the others. Next, there are the artificers who ply their several crafts by themselves and do not intermix. And also there's the class of shepherds and hunters, as well as that of husbandmen. And you will observe, too, that the warriors in Egypt are distinct from all other classes and are commanded by law to devote themselves solely to military pursuits. Moreover, the weapons which they carry are shields and spears, a style of equipment which the goddess taught the, of, a style of equipment which the goddess taught of Asiatics first to us, as in your part of the world first to you. Hmm. 
Then as to wisdom, do you observe how far, do you observe how our law from the very first made a study of the whole order of things, extending even to prophecy and medicine, which gives health? Out of these divine elements, deriving was deriving what was needful of human life and adding every sort of knowledge which is akin to them. All this order and arrangement the goddess first imparted to you when she established your city, and she chose the spot of earth in which you were born because she saw that the happy temperament of the seasons in that land would produce the wisest of men. Wherefore, the goddess, who is a lover both of war and of wisdom, selected and, selected and first of all settled that spot which was the most likely to produce men like us herself. And there you dwelt, having such laws as these, and still better ones, and excelled all mankind in all virtue, and as, as became the children and disciples of the gods. So one thing that's interesting here is he's kind of laying out a different uh, origin story for, for Athens. Um, he's saying... Um, oh, where did I, where did I lose that? <laughs> Earlier on, he says that, 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 uh, that Athena was given, or that Athens was given to Athena, essentially, uh, and Hephaestus. Um, but that's not like the traditional uh, origin story of Athens. The traditional origin story of Athens, uh, is, or I'm sorry, of Athena being the, the patron deity of Athens, yeah. is that uh, Cecrops, who was the first king of Athens, founded the, the city, and then he was trying to find a patron deity. So he invited both Athena and Poseidon to, you know, audition for the job. <laughs> <laughs> Poseidon struck his trident in the Acropolis, and a saltwater spring came up. And the, Athen the, the Athenians were like, okay, cool, saltwater, great. <laughs> <laughs> Athena struck her spear in the ground, and then she planted an olive tree. And the Athenians were like, hey, we can use that. Yeah. And so Athena was their patron deity. <laughs> um, this is sort of like the traditional origin story, uh, but there's this is one. Uh, this is a, so Plato's kind of presenting a little bit of a of a of a different origin story for. But aren't we talking about a lost Atlantis? I mean, a lost of Athens in this story, one that is gone because it was wiped out uh, in the deluge or whatever. It didn't, isn't he talking about that? Some so it's a pre destruction destruction Atlantis. So it can't, it's probably not the one that was founded later afterwards, right? I, I mean, unless it was the same, this, the same, I mean, so this gets into a whole question too, then I guess of, so the ages of mankind and the destructions playing a part in those changes between the ages. Yeah. Um, so you guys, you listen to the, that the, 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 the podcast about the theogony, right? Uh, Hesiod's theogony. Yeah. Yeah. So that goes through the, the ages, yep. the, the the age of gold, the age of silver, the age of bronze, the age of heroes, the age of iron. Yep. Plato talks about these in some of his other dialogues, and he he ties the destructions into the changing of the ages. So yeah. The, the silver age is is the age, and this gets into a whole, I guess, other thing. And I'm not saying you're wrong about what you're saying because you can certainly be right. It's just a matter of if the destruction if, if the destruction that he's talking about that ends at, uh, Atlantis is the end of the Silver Age, then, you know, so then that was, a, and it could have been a previous Athens. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, what you're it, saying, yeah. It seems to me, uh, and I don't know about the ages or, if, or where to put it in the ages, uh, but for sure, it seems like what the Egyptian priest is saying to Solon that, you know, the, like before the most recent destruction, there was this much better Atlantis. Isn't that kind of, much I mean, I'm sorry, Athens, yeah. much better Athens. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I keep saying Atlantis. He's saying like, no, the, yeah. yeah. And, and so I I get the implication, at least, that Athens was also destroyed in the destruction. No, it, it was for sure. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. No, I mean, you're right about that. Yeah. And it, it, this all just goes back to how you want to interpret things. And there's nothing... There's nothing incorrect necessarily about that way of reading the story. Yeah. Um, so, so I, all I'm saying is a different origin for the pre-destruction Atlant uh, Athens makes sense. No, uh, yep. Yeah. For sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's 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 certainly a possibility. Yeah. I mean, and and that the, he talks about in Critias in this dialogue. We'll get to it towards the end. He talks about one part of Athens getting destroyed, but in Critias he gets talks about a different part of it. But yeah, in okay. the in the, th the the catastrophe that destroys Atlantis, Athens is also yeah. destroyed. Which right. goes back to Kyle's point of like the ideal state. What is 
how did the why why is the ideal state destroyed if yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I thought these were the good guys right? <laughs> okay so uh, many great and wonderful deeds are recorded of your state in our histories but one of them exceeds all the rest in greatness and valor for these histories tell of a mighty power which unprovoked made an expedition against the whole of Europe and Asia and to which your city put an end. This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable. And there was an island situated in front of the straits, which are by you called the Pillars of Hercules. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together hmm. and was the way to other islands. From these, you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent, which surrounded the true ocean. From this sea, which is within the Straits of Hercules, is only... <clears throat> For this sea, which is within the Straits of Hercules, is only a harbor, having a narrow entrance, but that other sea is a real sea, and the surrounding land may be most truly called a boundless continent. Now in this island of Atlantis, there was a great and wonderful empire which had rule over the whole island and several others, and other parts on over parts of the continent, and furthermore, the men of Atlantis had subjected the parts of Libya within the columns of Hercules as far as Egypt, and of Europe as far as Tyrrhenia, Tyrrhenia, essentially Italy. This vast power, gathered into one, endeavored to subdue at a blow our country and yours and the whole of the region within the straits. And then, Solon, your country shone forth in the excellence of her virtues and strength among all mankind. Hmm. So this, this paragraph has a couple things of what I was talking about earlier as far as translations. Yeah, the sea. So You're... the sea, yeah. The the. The Greeks have a couple different words for sea, and then the word they use for ocean is okinos. And the word okinos doesn't appear anywhere in Timaeus or Critias. Okay. So if you read the Thomas Taylor translation, ocean never appears anywhere in the Timaeus or the Critias. Only the word sea. Uh, Jowett uses the word sea. A lot of other translators will use the word, I'm sorry, Jowett uses the word ocean. A lot of other translators use the word ocean as well. Um, but it's the the words that Plato uses are uh, pantos and pelagos, and I, I'm not, I don't know Greek, <laughs> so everything everything I'm saying to you about all this stuff I learned from reading books by people who supposedly know Greek. So okay, yeah, this isn't like me saying like ah, I know Greek and I know all this stuff. Um, <laughs> but the if you look at the actual Greek though, it the 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 word okinos never appears in the Atlantis dialogues. It does appear in other works of Plato. So he was familiar with the word and the concept, and it's it, this doesn't this isn't to say that he's not talking about the Atlantic Ocean. I'm not saying he's not talking about the Atlantic. Well, Ocean. okay. One key is that the uh, um, the surrounding land is a boundless continent, right? Now he's obviously not talking about Europe. Yeah. So. Where are you going to get, you're going to go across a sea and come to a boundless continent? It would be the well, same he's continent. Saying, he's saying uh, the opposite continent, which surrounded the true ocean. So he's saying the opposite continent surrounded the true ocean. Yeah. And this, again, this all goes back to how you're going to read this part of it. And this is the Jowett translation. So even some of these other words <laughs> might yeah. have been translated weirdly, right? So, again, I'm not trying to make a point that he's not talking about the Atlantic Ocean. Right. All I'm trying to say is liter it, what he's literally saying is Atlantic Sea. Yeah. yeah. That, could be, that and, could be the Atlantic Ocean. That yeah. absolutely could be the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, because if you imagine the sea, the, the ocean levels were 400 feet lower and there, were, uh, there was, you know, a whole different isostatic situation with the, with the crust under the ocean it, if, if it was pushed up. You know, because it didn't have nearly as much seawater weight on it, then it could be like seas. Because there, I, I mean, this island, land. this island was massive, obviously. So it's like, well, and that's that, so. Then that we're going to do another thing because yeah, it says the island was larger than Libya and Asia put together. So a lot of people who read this, you know, just given the context of that time, they think larger means larger in military might. And not necessarily ah. in like land mass. Okay. So again, we're getting to a thing of like, what, how are you going to read this? <laughs> yeah. It can be read many different ways. I gotcha. It could be land mass, but like, so when it says larger than Libya and Asia, the Libyans 
were like long time, like the Egyptians were always fighting the Libyans. And then they were always fighting people coming from essentially canon coming from Asia. So if the Egyptians were referring to somebody as larger than Libyan Asia, they might have meant more powerful than our two long time enemies put together. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, you know that's I mean? a good point. So there's there's so many different ways to read this whole section. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the, the surrounding thing, I've always thought, you know, because you're thinking about it on a map, but if you put this, if you put you put your image on a globe, you know, because I'm I'm not flat Earth, right? We put the image on a globe, <laughs> and then you do see that the North American continent, pretty much literally, if it's on the globe, is surrounding the Atlantic Sea, the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so it it. it but you're right. There, you know, there's all kinds of issues here on uh, what what do they mean with size and what does he mean by surround and when we're talking about sea does he mean ocean is this like a euphemism you know so yeah it, it, I, I take your point that there's interesting problems and questions with this section um yeah and i guess that's my only point is i i, I personally just for full disclosure i don't have a like favorite atlantis location <laughs> <laughs> i don't have like a spot i think it's at so I don't necessarily have a preferred way of reading all this. Like it could be the Atlantic Ocean he's talking about, but I also don't think it's out of the question he's talking about the Mediterranean either. Uh, so yeah, you know, if the if the levels were lower, the Mediterranean could even present itself as like different. Even if you look at the Mediterranean now, it almost seems like different seas. There's like a Western Sea and an Eastern Sea. Yeah. Um. So it. it I don't know. It's just there's a lot of different ways of reading this particular yeah, portion. Yeah, that's another thing. It would be like, what would the Mediterranean look like if the seas were 400 feet lower? Yeah. Would it be would actually, it even would be it even connected? have water in it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good well, question. yeah. Would they be connected between east and west? Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. that's a, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, th these are all, I, I'm pretty sure, I don't know a ton about it, but I know during the last ice age, I think during the last ice age, the Mediterranean went through like a salinity crisis because the levels kept getting lower. Yeah, because it wasn't getting water inflow from the ocean. Yeah, uh, I could be misremembering that, but yeah, I, this is one of those things where I seem to remember. So, I I thought I remembered something where there was the idea that it might have been dry at some point, and then there was an inflow, an inflow, basically like that. Something collapsed. Yeah. Yes, it was lower than sea level. Yeah, but dry, and then whatever the overflow from. The rising oceans eventually just filled it in. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what that was. I don't, too, I don't yeah. remember. So uh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> so another another thing, and this isn't a translation issue. This is this is more of a meaning of the word issue, uh, and it, this isn't the only one of these. But I, and just since we're talking about it in this particular uh, paragraph, is that the word island? So in ancient Greek, neso, nosos, nesos, nesos, nosos. I'm probably mispronouncing that. But nesos. Yeah. There was a point where island to the Greeks meant more than just island. So I'm going to read a, a paragraph, and this comes from a paper written by a Greek uh, academic named Stavos Papamerandopoulos. And he writes, in the case of the Greek language, it is known that the word island got the meaning we have today only in the 5th century BC, when Herodotus added for the first time the word peninsula. Because Atlantis was an old story in accordance with the Platonic text, then the word island in Greek before the 5th century BC had the possible meanings of promontory or peninsula. Peloponnese is a good example for demonstrating the above mentioned argument because it was never an island, but yet it was called as such always from prehistoric to historic times. Hmm. So depending on who is calling this an island, whether it's Salon or Plato might depend on what island actually means. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so, so this is the kind of the same with the Egyptians is the Egyptians at that time also supposedly didn't have like their word for island meant basically the same thing. It just meant basically like a peninsula or something that was mostly surrounded by water. Hmm. You know, but so didn't have to be necessarily completely surrounded by water. Didn't necessarily have to be what we would consider an island today. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, so the combination of like all of this, you know, it makes it so that like it's hard to to. It's hard. I don't know. For me, it's hard to think of this as like a treasure map. <laughs> yeah because some people will look at it and they'll 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 because in uh in in uh critias he even describes like he'll even describe in more detail where like you know he'll mention place names of where to go to you know like it's i think he mentions the name gadiz or gadiera <clears throat> and again it's it's just 
the, the same thing is with place names too, because for the Greeks, as they explored further and further to the West, they named things as they went. And so a lot of place names for the Greeks moved to the West. Yeah. So just depending on when, you know, when in time the story, Salon brought the story back and then how much of it was Salonic and how much of it was Platonic might depend on what some of these words mean. So it just, we get into this whole situation of but what I, does anything actually mean? I also, you know, if we, if we just take it for what it sounds like, you know, which is the idea that if it was if it was a civilization that we're talking about that was during the Ice Age or during maybe during the Younger Dryas, even some the most recent icy period. Uh, it seems to be in there, you know, that they're out in the Atlantic somewhere, probably the, you know, maybe the, in the Azores or something like that. It sounds like they're saying that Atlantis, that this uh, civilization controlled part of the big continent that surrounded the ocean, which means north america or the americas that's really interesting i know that's a lot of ifs right yeah and so it, it says yeah, <laughs> over parts of the continent yeah and then it says and furthermore subjected parts of libya within the columns and parts of europe so they're referring to the continent separate from europe and libya yeah exactly which sounds to me like they're saying that this he because he says earlier the opposite continent which surrounds the true ocean and there he's saying that atlantis controlled parts of it that's very interesting Yep. And, and again, it all depends on context. So I've, I've heard the same thing is if you're looking at it from the point of view of the Egyptians, then this, and I've heard this in relation to the, the Minoan uh, hypothesis. And again, I'm not uh, necessarily a supporter of this one, but this is just sort of pe support people who are supporters of the Minoan hypothesis will present this sort of thought experiment where if the Egyptians are talking about it, well, to the Egyptians, Crete is to the West of them. Hmm. In the in the what the Egyptians is called the Great Green, they refer to the Mediterranean and the Red Sea as the Great Green. So to the west in the Great Green, and then you would from the from Crete, you would you would uh, where does it say you would uh, Crete was the way to the other islands. Oh, yeah. So if, from Egypt, if you go to the other side of Crete, there's the Cyclades, which is a whole bunch of islands just north of Crete, and then from these you might pass the whole of the opposite continent, which surrounded the true here it says true ocean, but it would be true sea. Yeah. So that would be Europe surrounding the Mediterranean, surrounding okay. the true sea. Yeah. So again, I'm not necessarily saying I support that interpretation, but depending on whose geographical perspective this is coming from, if this is coming from an Egyptian perspective, then the yeah. opposite continent could be Europe. <laughs> but continue the sentence. For this sea, which is within the Straits of Hercules, is only a harbor having a narrow so, interest. I mean, that's... But, what are, but again, so then what are the straits? At one point, the strait between Sicily and Italy was referred to as the Straits of Hercules. And that's sort of the divider between the Western and the Eastern Mediterranean. So it's entirely possible that the Eastern Mediterranean is this harbor and the Medi Western Mediterranean is the sea. The true sea. <clears throat> yeah, the true sea, yeah. Hmm. Um, again, there's... A lot of different ways to interpret this. I've seen other interpretations involving the Black Sea. Yeah. Where the straits, the, the pillars of Hercules are the separation between the Aegean Sea and the Black Sea. Uh, where the, you know, they're saying the Black Sea is a harbor. And then that's a you know a pathway to the the real sea, which is the Mediterranean. Hmm. Um Yeah, this is why no one's found Atlantis yet. It's well, because <laughs> it could be anywhere. <laughs> yes. It, it, this is the thing, right? Like, I mean, this gets to another point and I don't necessarily know if this is, well, this gets to another point is what would you actually have to find to say that you had found Atlantis? Atlantis. Well, you'd have to, well, yeah. you know, you'd have to, like, what? Would, yeah. you have to, would you have to find the literal circular city? Yeah, like, I don't. If you just found a temple to Poseidon underwater, would that yeah. be enough? Yeah, that's a great you know what I mean? question. Like, what, like if you found, let's say, you found some pyramids underwater, but you didn't find the circular city, would would that be Atlantis? Everyone would say I mean, it this was. This is a question I'm, I'm I ask myself all the time. Like, how would you actually say I found? Like, obviously, if you well, found the circular city, then you would say yes, I found Atlantis. Yeah. <laughs> but short of that, if you just found a city underwater, let's say, yeah, like how would you know whether that was Atlantis or not? Yeah. Good question. Yeah, go, go to the post office. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. So uh, there was a lot of talk there. So 
Yeah, this vast power gathered into one endeavored to subdue and blow our country and yours and the whole of the region within the straits. And then Salon, your country shone forth in the excellence of her virtue and strength among all mankind. She was preeminent in courage and military skill and was the leader of the Hellenes. And when the rest fell off from her being compelled to stand alone after having undergone the very extremity of danger, she defeated and triumphed over the invaders and preserved from slavery those who were not yet subjugated and generously liberated all the rest of us who dwell within the pillars. But afterwards, there occurred violent earthquakes and floods. And in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared in the depths of the sea, for which reason the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was the cause, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. So we'll just ignore the mention of mud for now. <laughs> inside, inside Discord joke, joke yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> But yeah, what, so, what, is it, what does he mean to all of us who dwell within the pillars? What does that mean? That, that means, yeah, I guess if, if the pillars are the Strait of Gibraltar, then all of us who dwell within the Strait of Gibraltar. Okay. I mean, it just depends on, yeah, I mean, I, it's so, and this is the thing, because according to this previous one, they had already subjugated Europe as far as Egypt and Tyrrhenia, so as far as Italy. Yeah. Um, so then I guess the question is, yeah, is, is the, is the then freeing all, or, so could they were referred to as being inside the pillars? Yeah. So it, it goes back to where the pillars are, I guess. Um, right. But that's what, basically what that's what they're saying is within the pillars, meaning, meaning past it, past the pillars, behind the pillars between right on this side of the pillars from the sea, I guess is what yes. he's, what he's yep. saying. Okay. That's what I get from it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, generously liberated all the rest of us who dwell within the pillars. So, so you know, so Atlantis had the, the, the what I get from it as, you know, because Athens had, you know, been standing alone, having undergone the very extremity of danger. So, you know, Atlantis had defeated a bunch of other people and enslaved yeah. a bunch of other places within the pillars. And Athens was the one who, who fought back and managed to the thing is everybody. they never say Egypt was subjugated. Yeah. So then the question is, did Athens like join forces with Egypt with and Egypt. fight back? And that's why the Egyptians remember the Athenians as being so heroic because they were fighting alongside them. Yeah. Um, or, you know, I mean, I guess it, that seems possible, you know, cause the, you know, if, if you are confronted with this vast military power, you'd, Maybe try to ally with whoever you could. Yeah. <laughs> it's also interesting. He says all of your warlike men in a body sank into the earth. Whereas the yeah. island of Atlantis disappeared into the depths of the sea. Yes. So the question is, is where were the Athenian soldiers? Were they in Atlantis? Were they like occupying Atlantis at the time? Or was this separate incidents? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like it does say Atlantis violent earthquakes yeah. at the same time that Athens was destroyed, but they were both destroyed in their own areas. Right. Violent earthquakes and floods. So Atlantis goes underwater. Athens goes under the earth. Wow. So in this one, it just says the soldiers were destroyed, but in Critias, he also talks about Athens being inundated as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it, it certainly seems like whatever catastrophe was that destroyed Atlantis also affected Athens. Yeah. But did not affect Egypt because Egypt survives everything according to Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> they remember because they're still there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing, I mean, this gets to though, like you too, like you said too, that, you know, the, all the Athenian soldiers died, you know, I'll, I'll just, I, I had mentioned before Stephen Kershaw's book, the search for Atlantis and he's an academic. This is sort of his overall like takeaway from the story of Atlantis. Overall, the message of the Atlantis dialogues might be taken as a timeless one about the pernicious effects of wealth on a ruling class, or as an early precursor to Sir John Dowling, Dahlberg Acton's power tends to corrupt, corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is like the common take from yeah. Atlantis. It's a morality tale. Most of the time in the morality tales, the good guys don't die. Yeah, that's right. right. In this case, the good guys die. So I don't think it's a morality tale. And then especially since the Egyptian priests, you know, starts the whole thing off by being like, yeah, those stories about uh, Phaeton, that happened. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. I think he's basically saying, you know, this is all connected, right? Like, right. The reason I'm telling you this story is because of this fate and stuff I'm talking about, right? Like, yeah, what they're really talking about is what did he call it? The declination of certain celestial bodies the that come into contact. Declination of bodies as they move around the earth. Yes. yes. Yeah. We're talking about comet fragments. <laughs> yes, exactly. Coming into the earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what I get from it. Um, I I just don't like. I don't know. I don't. I don't know why you would write a morality tale and then have the the good guys die. Plus, Plato doesn't like write morality tales. He undermines morality tales mm. in a lot of ways. Like all of these like simplistic ideas of virtue. His whole thing is undermining simplistic ideas of what virtue is. Ah, and then this take is basically like, yeah, that's all about corrupt power and stuff. It's like, okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, there, cool. there, there, there also doesn't seem to be, I mean, I, uh, maybe there is later or maybe in the, uh, in later dialogues, this implication that the reason Atlantis disappeared was because they were so, you know, evil that none of that. I haven't seen that yet. It just said that there was a big war. Athens manages to win and freeze all the people inside the pillars and then after that, there's a giant earthquake and flood and everything is destroyed. It doesn't connect these things necessarily. So in, in Critias, which isn't finished, there is a part right at the very end where they talk about Zeus deciding to act because of the, you know, uh, it's essentially they're talking about the, the Athenians losing their godly spirit and becoming more mortal, essentially, which is essentially, the, you know, their descent from godlike beings to regular humans and yeah. Zeus sees this and he decides to act you know so it, it's unfinished so you know we know what he does is there's a war and there's a catastrophe typically what happens is Zeus is like well I'll show them up by having Athens this little piddly thing of a country or piddly thing of a city state defeat them in war to show them that they're nothing. Yeah. And then if, after they didn't learn their lessons, then I'll send the catastrophe. <laughs> Obviously none of that was written. So we really don't know what the actual story was, but that would seem to fit sort of, you know, what Zeus would do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of like a how hardened Pharaoh's heart kind of guy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes. Yeah. It's kind of very much in that sort of, sort of realm. So, you know, if he wants to teach the Atlanteans a le lesson, then he would have the Athenians beat them in a war, right? Like that would be his way of, teaching them a lesson so but uh, you know again like Critias ends what i'm saying ha i keep saying halfway through we obviously don't know how far way through is it was because he didn't finish it yeah <laughs> but <laughs> it seems like it's about halfway through if you read it. Um, <laughs> nasa would say it's 90 percent done that's right <laughs> well, yeah, it's about 50 percent and if we get back to the that jb kennedy's uh jb kennedy's guys talk about like divisions within the dialogues at the 50% mark, there's usually talk about Zeus and, and justice. And that's pretty much what he's talking about when the dialogue cuts off. Okay. So, so there's an indication that it's possible that, that that was literally the 50% mark of the dialogue right there. All right. Um, well, we're more than, yeah, and that's the unfortunate part, right? Like, so Critias, <laughs> it talks all about Athens. It talks all about Atlantis, uh, but it doesn't talk about the war and the catastrophe. Yeah. So we have all this information about Athens, Atlantis, but we have very, very little information about the actual war and the actual catastrophe. That's true. Yeah, it's 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 very brief. It sank into the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to we got to take a break. Yeah, it's all it's all in the mud. <laughs> and take another break. This is great. We'll yep. be Loving right every back. minute of it. Yep. back ladies and gentlemen joined by uh snake force tony from the discord we are talking plato and atlantis and uh just discussing all the possibilities here very interesting going through the text 
And uh, this has been fantastic. Final segment. You think you can? Uh, you think you can wrap it up? Or are we going to have to do more uh, more well, episodes? Uh, well, if you want to talk about my my super hot take, we're going to have to do more episodes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, we can we can definitely we got the the actual Atlanta story is all wrapped up now, so it's just basically housekeeping at this point. All right, cool. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we'll just continue with the dialogue. So. Uh, the last thing I said was about the island uh, sinking. Uh, and so the story of Atlantis at this point is over. Uh, so then Critias says, I have told you briefly, Socrates, what the age Critias heard from Solon and related to us. And when you were speaking yesterday about your city and citizens, the tale which I have just been repeating to you came into my mind. And I remarked with astonishment how, by some mysterious coincidence, you agreed in almost every particular with the narrative of Solon. But I did not like to speak at the moment. For a long time had elapsed, and I had forgotten too much. I thought that I must first of all run over the narrative in my own mind, and then I would speak. And so I readily assented to your request yesterday, concerning that in all such cases, the chief difficulty is to find a tale suitable to our purpose, and that in such a tale, we should be fairly well provided. Um, so the mysterious coincidence, I think is funny, by some mysterious coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by some mysterious coincidence, these stories are exactly what we want, the story is exactly what I wanted. Um, <laughs> I th this, I think, causes a lot of people to think that Plato's bullshitting and just made it all up, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Socrates does this a lot. He's a bullshit. And maybe the dialogue Prot Protagoras is the best example of this. So in that dialogue, the, the, the premise of the dialogue Protagoras is Socrates uh, is, I had mentioned this earlier, uh, a friend of his comes up to him and is like, hey, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I just came from a uh, house where I was talking to Protagoras. Let, listen to what happened. So then he tells the whole story. The story is someone came over to his house and got him and said, hey, Protagoras is in town. Protagoras is a famous sophist. So he's essentially one of Plato's like, or, I'm sorry, one of Socrates' rivals. Right? Socrates is like essentially, you know, he's competing with the sophists. Okay. So, so he's like, all right, we're going to go over there. We're going to talk to him. So on the way over there, Socrates and this guy have a little conversation and then they get to the place and then Socrates and Protagoras like have their big debate. And it, there's a couple things in it Socrates does where <laughs> it's like, you know, it kind of, this is a great one to kind of show his, his kind of bullshit nature, his bullshitty nature. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, at one point, you know, he's doing his whole question and answer thing with, with Protagoras. So Socrates, he's, he's known for the Socratic method where he just asks questions. And essentially what he's doing is he's, he, a lot of times they're, they're leading questions. They're typically yes or no questions. And he's typically, a lot of times he'll set up straw man or he'll like, he'll give you, you know, uh, two options where it's like, well, there's more options than the, just those two, but he's only presenting the two options. Yeah. So he's doing this to Protagoras and Protagoras kind of maybe senses he's getting kind of, uh, you know, led into a corner. And so he launches into this like long speech. And after he's done, Socrates is basically like, I fell asleep, man. You're gonna have to keep your <laughs> I'm, he's like, I'm an old man. I can't remember very well. You got to keep your answers shorter, man. I can't, I, you know, because Socrates doesn't want him to give these long speeches. He wants to do the whole question and answer thing. Yeah. So Socrates is like, look, if you want to have a long speech contest, you win. I'm not going to compete with you on that. You win. So I want to do this thing. I want to do my question and answer thing. So stop giving me the long speeches and let's do that. And this other guy, Asablides, he's he kind of interrupts. He's like, yeah, Socrates is right. You know, you guys did speeches. Now do your question and answer thing. But then he's also like, but Socrates, come on. You have a great memory. Stop bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's like, you, your memory is fantastic. And again, the whole premise of the whole dialogue of Protagoras is Socrates is telling the entire telling story. This story to somebody else later on. <laughs> yeah, so he's telling him. the entire long <laughs> the speech. The entire dialogue to somebody else later on. With, <laughs> when, within the dialogue, he's saying, I have a bad memory. <laughs> so <laughs> Socrates great. is a bullshit. <laughs> Full stop. Also in that dialogue, he says, I'm not good at giving speeches. If you want to have a speech thing, you know, you win. In that same dialogue, he does give a big long speech. <laughs> Socrates does. Yeah. So he like in that same dialogue proves he's perfectly capable of giving big long speeches. And in the uh, tale, perfectly in the tale itself, he's telling both his long speech and the and other, the other guy's, guy's long, long speech. speech. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so he's a total. I know a guy like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 
so I don't know. So a lot of people read stuff like mysterious coincidence and then they read him say like reiterate again and again, this is a truthful tale and they just see Socrates bullshit. The thing is, you know, this is Critias who's telling this tale, not Socrates. So Socrates or Plato presents Socrates as a bullshitter a lot, but he doesn't necessarily often present other people as bullshitters that often. Um, so I don't know. It, it also doesn't, I don't know. It just strikes me as, as like odd that, that he would then uh, start. And then essentially too, cause then he's calling Salon a, a BSer too. In yeah. This, in this story. If, if that's like the implication. And the Egyptians. Yeah. Yeah. And the Egyptians. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, I just want to point out some of that stuff just because this mysterious coincidence line to me, it smacks a little bit of like, you know, there's a lot of these things that line up and they probably line up because Plato's fudging some of the details so that it fits his narrative. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't necessarily think he made the whole thing up. Yeah, um, I, I yeah. do see how you could say, all right, I see that for the purposes of, and again, we're, we're it, this is a nested situation, right? We've, Plato is actually writing all this down, but in the thing Plato's writing down, it's people telling each other stories. And in that situation, the idea is, is that Socrates wants these guys to give him this scenario where with the perfect state. Yes. So Critias is like, oh, well, I have this really interesting story that I got from my ancestor, you know, that, that, that got it from Solon. And it has this whole situation set up with a big war and an old an ancient civilization. And but I, maybe he adds in some of the perfect state stuff to make it match, you know, I can see that. But again, like Kyle pointed out, there's all these these geographical things. And the, like you said, that, you know, the good guys all die at the end. And like those things aren't necessarily part of describing the perfect state. Oh, no, no. And I, I think what you said is 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 basically my thoughts. Exactly right. Yeah. A lot of the stuff he talks about with the Athens of the time, as far as like, you know, uh, the 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 eugenics and the, the common children, all that kind of stuff. That stuff seems to me like stuff he added because that was in that's just part of his ideal of a perfect state. And it may or may not have actually been part of the original story. Yeah. Like I don't and I guess that yeah, basically what you're saying. It's kind of where I'm coming down on that as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so back to the story. And therefore, how did you say uh Randall pronounced uh, Hermocrates? Yeah, Hermocrates might be right, I okay. think. Well, yeah. I'll pronounce it the Randall way then. Okay. <laughs> and therefore, as Hermocrates has told you, on my way home yesterday, as I, I, I at once communicated the tale to my com to my companions as I remembered it. And after I left them during the night by thinking, I recovered near the whole of it. Truly, as is often said, the lessons of our childhood make a wonderful impression on our memories. For I am not sure that I could remember all the discourse of yesterday, but I should not be surprised if I forgot any of those things which I've heard very long ago. Hmm. So basically he's saying... I probably remember, I probably forgot some of the stuff we talked about yesterday with the ideal state. <laughs> but, but I totally I remember this, this story. poem I remembered when I was 10 years old or yeah. 14 years old or whatever it was. Um, yeah. So, and the thing too, just as far as like memory, because a lot of this has to do with like, people will say a lot of this has to do with Critias's memory <clears throat> and how, how like good his memory is. And this is an old man. And this kind of gets into, it's just, maybe we should, talk about real quick Plato's idea of knowledge. So in the dialogue Menno, Plato introduces this concept. For him, it, he introduces the concept of the immortal soul. And he does it by having, he has Socrates walk a slave through solving a geometric problem. And his, like the, the moral of this whole story is oh, yeah. that the slave knew this information all along he just had to remember it. He knew it because his soul was immortal. His soul at some point learned this information at some point in the life of the soul. And the boy just had to work to remember this information from his soul. Mm. So. To and, that, Plato, and that's by using reason, right? He's using. By using. Yeah. 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 Or just by like thinking and, and like thinking about your memory and then like looking into your soul. Yeah. But like to Plato, knowledge was memory in some ways, right? Like like the, the ability to recall is what can lead to knowledge. So some people will, will, will latch onto this idea of, 
uh, Critias maybe not having a good memory as maybe kind of throwing a wrench into the story. And I think from Plato's point of view, the fact that he had to think and remember the story may be seen as like a virtue for the story. Like, right. Like he's, uh, he's mm-hmm. saying, this yeah. is a story that this person actually he's pulling the knowledge. You know, the they're, true knowledge. they're pulling knowledge from themselves. For this. Yes. I think that's kind of what he's saying there. At least that's my take on it. Um, okay. Yeah. My take on the, on the knowledge thing was that by using reason, like he would use, like Socrates would use the, the question and answer thing to kind of lead the witness in a way, but, but using the witness's own reason so that ultimately by asking a series of questions, the witness would, or I'm saying witness, but the person he's questioning would arrive at the right answers, even though previously he didn't actually know that information. He was just led there and having to use his own reason in answering the questions arrived at the, at the right answers. Yep. And well, and who's going to convince a person of a thing themselves or someone else? Yeah, yeah. themselves. Yeah. So if Socrates gets that person to say that thing, then yeah. he's convinced them essentially. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. That's, I think, the point. But I yeah. thought he, I, I thought the point of, of pulling the knowledge from memory was that the memory idea was that we actually are these eternal beings and we really do remember all this, no- or we have all this knowledge. We just don't remember it. So he would use this questioning to get them to, to get remember, them to souls. even yeah. though they were really just working it out at the time, you know, it's a way of looking at what is reason, yeah. right? Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, no, for sure. Hmm. Yeah, no, it, 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 and there's, I mean, the, the, the crazy thing is that like this stuff was written 2,400 years ago and like a lot of his ideas about stuff are, are in a lot of ways relevant. I don't know. Yeah. You know, the eugenics isn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like the theory of the forms, I think is kind of relevant. Yeah, yeah the I think theory. that's cool. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so um, and it depends too on you know did did he I mean with this idealized state, <clears throat> is he just and we, there's no way to know this now, but is that something he ever thought could actually take place, or was he aware enough of human of human nature to know that that was never going to actually happen? Yeah, I was thinking that that it's like. It's like the idealized anything yeah. is in this other the it realm of is, forms. Yes, it is in the forms. And in and in our world, it's always the imperfect. I think you guys are thinking of exactly right. I think that's probably the way he thought of it too. Was his version of the ideal state is the form of the ideal state, and that such thing could never exist in the real world. Yeah. And he was aware of that. It was not like he in, in the Republic. He talks about the impossibility of the ideal state that they're describing ever actually coming into. Okay, place. so he's yeah, he's not. Okay, for sure. But it's good to try uh, to figure it, out. It's it, I mean, it's a good exercise to try to figure out. Yeah, just don't try to implement it. What is the ideal? <laughs> yeah, you. you <laughs> <laughs> well, you well, have. It's like the eugenic stuff, like. From his time, you know, again, like the, eugenics isn't a new thing. He's not the, you know, uh, it, it's been around for a while. So I'm not at all trying to make a case in favor of it. So don't misunderstand anything. No, of course. I say. But you can kind of see where a person could lead themselves down that line of thinking yeah. by just being like, well, this would be better than this. This would be better than that. And not like stepping back to like, look at the forest for the trees. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think the watcher pointed out when we were going through some of the eugenic stuff, he was like, Hey, this, a lot of this sounds like what we see, uh, in the, in the Zinda Vesta, right. This, the, the Zoroastrian thing. And that, that context is like, you know, you guys are going to have to go live underground for a long time. And here are all these precautions you're going to have to take that are sort of, you know, totalitarian in nature, but it's because you are trapped until the cat- cataclysm that's taking place on the surface is done. And I want you to, the god, you know, Ahura Mazda is saying, I want you to survive. Here are the things you're going to have to do in order to survive through this cataclysm while living in a, a hole in the ground. And some of it is is eugenic in, in a way. There's all this this very, you know, the guarded types of uh, breeding and everything. So custodian it, BS. Yeah, there you go. It's custodial <laughs> BS. <laughs> you must chop down the mightiest tree in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, back to the story. Yeah. I listened at the time with childlike interest to the old man's narrative. 
He was very ready to teach me, and I asked him again and again to repeat his words so that like an indelible picture, they were branded into my mind. As soon as the day broke, I rehearsed them as he spoke them to my companions, that they, as well as myself, might have something to say. And now, Socrates, to make an end, to make an end of my preface, I am ready to tell you the whole tale. I will give you not only the general heads, but the particulars, as they were told to me, the city and its citizens, which you yesterday described to us in fiction, we will now transfer to the world of reality. It shall be the ancient city of Athens, and we will suppose that the citizens whom you imagined were our verifiable and who are veritable ancestors of whom the priests spoke. They will perfectly harmonize, and there will be no inconsistency in saying that the citizens of your republic are these ancient Athenians. Let us divide the subject among us, and all endeavor, according to our ability, gracefully, to execute the task which you have imposed upon us. Consider then, Socrates, if this narrative is suited to the purpose, or whether we should seek some other instead. So, the I guess at this point, I'm just going to make a uh, make a point of uh, bringing up Plutarch. So, Plutarch was a uh, first century uh, Platonist. So a, Plato, a, a, Plato, a Plato inspired uh, philosopher. Uh, he was a head of one of the heads of the, or no, he wasn't a head of the Academy, I'm sorry. Uh, but he was a, uh, a biographer. So he wrote a bunch of biographies of different people, Greeks and Romans. He wrote a biography of Salon. And at the end of the biography, he talks about uh, Atlantis and his not finishing it. So I'm just gonna read that part right now. So this is from Plutarch's biography of Salon. Now Salon, having begun the great work in verse, the history or fable of the Atlantic island, which he had learned from the wise men of Sais and thought convenient for the Athenians to know, abandoned it. Not as Plato says, by reason of want of time, but because of his age and being discouraged at the greatness of the task. Plato, willing to approve, improve the story of the Atlantic island as if it were a fair estate that wanted an heir and came with some title to him, formed indeed stately entrances, noble enclosures, large courts, such as net such as never yet introduced any story, fable, or poetic fiction, but beginning it late, ended his life before his work, and the reader's regret for the unfinished part is the greater, as the satisfaction he takes and that which is complete is extraordinary. For as the city of Athens left only the temple of Jupiter at Olympus unfinished, so Plato, amongst all his excellent works, left only this piece about the Atlantic island imperfect. Hmm. So the thing that drives me crazy is how he's like, you would not believe the way he finished the story. It was so awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't you finish the story? <laughs> <laughs> but also just the idea that, I mean, essentially what he's saying is Plato had Salon's notes. He took that story and he made it his own story. Yeah. So again, we're dealing with like what parts of the story of Atlantis are platonic and what parts are Salonic, right? Like, What's the original Salonic story, of which I don't doubt there is one, but then what parts did Plato add to it to, you know, to make it his own, so to speak? Yeah, maybe maybe Plato was reading it and he was just like, man, this is, this is an antiquated way of writing and <laughs> not very good. <laughs> he probably just didn't like it. And he just was like, well, I'll take the, I'll, you know, basically take the gist of it and remake it. Could have been that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's entirely possible. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing it's we like, don't know. We how don't... how much older was Solon? Like uh, six... two hundred years, it's roughly two hundred years before Plato. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Solon was born roughly two hundred years before Plato was born. Yeah. So I mean, that's yeah. You read stuff from two hundred years ago, and it's it's written quite a bit different. I mean, obviously, people were there were great writers, but I mean, in a lot of cases, the 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 wording and the everything is so different. You yeah. would you would want to rewrite it in a modern way if you were trying to write something for, um, you know, to publish in modern times. I guess. Yeah, I mean, at Could the be. same time, they would recite the poems of Homer all the time. At the yeah, same, that's at, true. In Plato's time, and those are much older than Salon. So. That's cool. <laughs> but no, I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong. I mean, he certainly. I definitely think he would want to like update it so that it was his. But whether that means just changing the words or and like updating the, you know, like the the context, or if that means like whole cloth changing things, like I I don't I don't know. Maybe he didn't change anything, but just added things. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like I, maybe Plutarch's making all that up. Who the fuck? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it's like it's so much of this is, uh, 
you know, I guess it's trying to figure out what parts are part of the original Salon right. story, I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Um, so then Socrates says, and what other Critias can we find that will be better than this, which is of natural and suitable to the festival of the goddesses and has the very great advantage of being a fact and not a fiction. How shall we find another if we abandon this? We cannot. And therefore you must tell the tale and good luck to you. And I, in return for my yesterday's discourse, will now rest and be a listener. Critias says, let me proceed to explain to you, Socrates, the order in which we have arranged our entertainment. Our intention is that Timaeus, who is the most of, who is the most of an astronomer amongst us and has made the nature of the universe his special study, would speak first, beginning with the generation of the world and going down to the creation of man. Next, I am to receive the men whom he has created and of whom some will be have profited by the excellent education which you have given them, and then in accordance with the tale of Solon, and equally with his law, we will bring them into court and make them citizens, as if they were those very Athenians whom the sacred Egyptian record has recovered from oblivion. And thenceforth, we will speak of them as Athenians and fellow citizens. Wow. Man. So <laughs> he's laying out what's going to happen, right? Like, yeah. so the rest of this dialogue, Timaeus is going to do his astronomer thing. And he's going to go through the creation of the universe to the creation of man. And that's what Timaeus does. He gives you the life, the universe, and everything speech. <laughs> so in, in some ways, it's interesting. Like the Timaeus is a really super interesting dialogue in that Plato kind of starts with his mentor being executed for teaching about the gods, essentially, is like the, the excuse the Athenian state gives for executing Plato is, I'm sorry, for executing Socrates, is that he was... Uh, teaching people to disregard the gods and to like look in the heavens and stuff like that. Plato is now writing a dialogue all about the cosmos, but he's found a way to sort of make that okay with the authorities by making it so that God, what he calls the demiurge in the dialogue, is the one who's the creator of it all and was kind of responsible for it. But at the same time, he is able to keep his idea of the forms intact because essentially the way he proposes that it all works is the creator God has like materials of creation. He's using those materials of creation to try to replicate the forms. So that's, that's the thing he's, he's creating the world in like, in like a, uh, and he's looking at the form of the world and he's trying to create it. Yeah. But the materials he's using are just constantly decaying. So he's constantly having to create, he's always creating. It's always the process of creating never stops. It's always becoming right. Like yeah. he's always in the process of refashioning creation to account for the, these materials that he just can't, you know, so Plato's presenting a picture where God is perfect, which is what the state wanted to see where the forms are perfect, which is what his idea was, but he found a way to make those reflect the reality we see, which is not perfect which is that yeah. the materials that the God is using to create the world are the thing that are fucking everything up. Yeah. It's not God's <laughs> fault that the materials suck. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he's constantly having to fix everything all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's just a handyman. <laughs> but yeah. And, and, and he goes, I mean, tell is more than that. Cause he goes into like, it goes into a whole bunch of stuff, but um, it, it's, if, I guess for the time. And you know, I guess I don't know because, I wasn't alive then, but if you read like some accounts of like the, you know, the Renaissance astronomers who encountered Timaeus for the first time, it's like this kind of eye-opening experience for them of reading it and being like, oh, wow, this is how I need to think about all this stuff. You know, not like the, in this Aristotelian way that I've been taught to think about it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that. I guess, yeah, that's, my take on the Timaeus. <laughs> um, bravo. Bravo. Yeah, excellent. That's great. So there's just one more thing I want to talk about though, uh, since we're done reading that and that's platonic myths. So a lot of, you know, people will talk about the story of Atlantis being created by, you know, made up by, by uh, Plato. You know, he created a myth because he was trying to tell a moral story or he was trying to, you know, we, we've been through like some of the reasons why he might have been telling it according to the, the academic view. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of want to go through some of the myths that are in some of the other dialogues and like how they're, those myths are used. So uh, in George's, there's a judgment myth. And you guys are familiar with the judgment myth. That's the myth where when you die, 
you go bef- before a panel of judges and they decide whether your soul goes to heaven or goes to hell. Yep. He didn't call it heaven and hell. He called it uh, the Isles of the Blessed or uh, Tartarus. Um, not Tartaria, Tartarus. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But it, 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 so the, 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 the point of this myth is, is to like illustrate uh, sort, sort, of, sort of a central point of this dialogue. But the myth happens at the very end of the dialogue. So he does this whole dialogue and like at the, it's like the capstone of the dialogue. Okay. Same with Phaedo. So Phaedo, Phaedo talks about the journey of the soul after death. So this is, it's, it somewhat deals with the judges, but it's more the, the entire journey. What the soul, and, and uh, was it Marty was talking about the wheel? Yeah. This, the journey of the soul in Phaedo, it, there's elements of that, that, kind of remind me of what Marty was talking about with who's, I don't remember the, the name of the Ray Hernandez. Yeah. Ray Hernandez. Yeah. Um, it, there were parts of that story that reminded of me of, of Plato's description of the journey of the soul in Phaedo. So that's mm. kind of interesting. To me. Wow. But again, that, that was a capstone myth that was at the end of a dialogue meant to sort of summarize a point. Right? Okay. Uh, in the Republic, there's the allegory of the cave, which you guys are familiar with. Yep. Um, that is about how, you know, people are, tied down in a cave and all they can see is shadows. It's, it's, it's meant to illustrate the theory of the forms. All they can see is shadows and projected in front of them, you know, and all they, their whole world is these shadows and that's all they know. So they don't know what the real world actually is, you know, which is what we consider the real world. Yeah. That the, um, the, the, the shadows, something... the shadows are coming from the light of the real world and the things out there are just projecting onto the wall of the cave. Yeah. And yeah. they so only, inter- those... yeah. Plato's yeah. basically trying to say like the way we view the real world is the way those people view the shadows on the cave. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. that. You can, I love that illustration because it's, it's in a way it's, I mean, I don't know if it's true, but it's basically you is talking about dimension. It is like we're seeing the three dimensional world, but really there's higher dimensions that we can't observe. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think the that's shadows cool. are two dimensional. The shadows are two dimensional, yeah. but they're really three dimensional, three dimensional objects that are moving around. And yeah, that's cool. Yeah, like that's that. why. Yeah, and that's I, that's why every time I always I always for whatever reason I keep thinking of the the forms as like quantum physics. I, I just can't get that out of my mind that his theory of the forms relates pretty well to quantum mechanics. Um, but again, the, the the allegory of the cave is a self contained little myth that happens within the Republic. Uh, another myth in the Republic is the myth of Ur. Uh, Ur dies in battle, and then he's uh, he, he also goes on a journey. It's a, it's a soul journey, kind of like Phaedo. It's a it's a bit of a different one. Um, but again, this is a sort of like capstone myth, and it, it talks about the different journeys for people who are just versus not just. And it, Republic has a lot to do with justice, and so that's yeah. kind of what that's about. Um, Phaedrus, there's a Thoth myth. And we can get into this in just a minute. Um, but the whole point of that myth is, is again, just underlying some of the points of Phaedrus that, you know, dialectic is the only way to acquire knowledge. Um, and again, this is a capstone kind of myth. Uh, and all, all of these cases, the, the myth is not the central point of the dialogue. The central point of the dialogue is the dialogue. The myth is just there to kind of like provide color. In the story of Atlantis, like, Critias isn't finished, but the entire dialogue is the story of Atlantis. So yeah. it's not like a myth contained within a dialogue. It's it's the whole dialogue in Critias. In Timaeus, it is a myth contained in a dialogue, but it's not typical of Plato in that it's not at the end. It's not summarizing what we just heard. It's introducing the dialogue. Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't fit with any of his other myths. And not only does it not fit, he also is pretty good about attributing stuff. So in Georges, the myth that he tells, he attributes to Homer. And it, it's a version of the thing, of a myth Homer tells. In Phaedo, he introduces that myth by saying, I can tell you a charming tale. Yeah. In Republic, he, mis- he introduces the cave analogy by saying, imagine. Yeah. In the Ur myth, he says, I will tell you a tale. Uh, in the Phaedrus myth, he says, I have heard a tradition of the ancients, whether true or not, only they know. Mm. So in none of these myths does he construct an elaborate origin story for the story. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. He would yeah. just say, I'm going to tell you a story about Atlantis. You know, he, he wouldn't be like, well, 
let me tell you about salon first of all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good it's point. That's like a great what point. He yeah. Typically did. So I don't know. I've I haven't found a single myth that he either misattributes or like in the case of some of these myths, he doesn't attribute. He just says, like, imagine this, or yeah. let me tell you a tale. Whereas in Atlanta story, he's clearly attributing that to Salon. He's he's giving a whole story about how this came from Salon, which doesn't fit except for in that, that myth, right? Like, I don't know. Yeah, he gives you he's giving you the the credentials of of the source. Yeah. He's yeah. like, he's like, this is coming from Critias, who got it from his grandfather, also called Critias, who got it from Salon, who wrote it down, and Salon got it from the Egyptians who have it written down in their temple in Saïs. Yeah, that's a quite a bit different. Than yeah. I'll tell you a charming tale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's going to tell. Um, so, oh, then, stop that. <laughs> so then I do want to actually just do the, the Thoth myth real quick, because it's interesting and you guys are fans of Thoth and Egypt. And oh yeah. Uh, I just think it's an interesting, and it, it just implies to, it, it applies to, to as well as like we were talking about stories within stories and the written word versus the non-written word, uh, and this kind of and it uh, there's also like the uh, this is actually uh, I don't know. Anyways, I'll just read this. So here's Socrates. At the Egyptian city of Nacris, there was a famous old god whose name was Thuth. The bird which was the the bird which is called the ibis is sacred to him, and he was the inventor of many arts such as arithmetic and calculation and geometry and astronomy and draughts and dice. But his great discovery was the use of letters. Now in those days, the god Thamus was the king of the whole country of Egypt, and he dwelt in the great city of Upper Egypt, with the, which the Hellenes call Egyptian Thebes. And the god himself is called by them Amon. To him came Thuth and showed these inventions, desiring that the other Egyptians might be allowed to have the benefit of them. He enumerated them. And Thomas inquired about their several uses and praised some of them and censured others as he approved or disproved them. It would take a long time to repeat all that Thamos said to Thuth, but in praise or blame of the various arts. But when they came to letters, this Thuth said Thuth will make the Egyptians wiser and give them better memories. Hmm. It is a specific both for the memory and for the wit. Thamus replied, O oh, most ingenious Thuth. The parent or an inventor of an art is not always the best judge of the utility or inutility of his own inventions or to the users of them. <laughs> and in this instance, you who are the father of letters from a paternal love of your own children have been led to attribute to them a quality which they cannot have. For this discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls because they will not use their memories. They will trust the external written characters and not remember of themselves. The specific which you have discovered is an aid not to memory, but to reminiscence. And you give your disciples not truth, but only the semblance of truth. They will be hearers of many things and will have learned nothing. Hmm. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. They will be tiresome company, having the show of wisdom without the reality. <laughs> Phaedrus, yes, Socrates, you can easily invent tales of Egypt or any other country. <laughs> So in this case, he specifically gets called out for inventing a tale from Egypt by the person in the dialogue. He creates this myth, and then the guy's like, yeah, you're really good at inventing stuff from Egypt. Yeah, you're making stuff up, yeah. So I don't know. I thought that was good for both. Of, like, it's a great myth just about, like, the writing and the, you know, memory and knowledge and stuff. But then also just because, like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> is this is this part of why uh, this is kind of like Socrates never wrote anything down, and so he's like kind of ragging on this guy, and this guy's like, yeah, yeah, you're making all that up. Is that sort of what's happening there? Well, that whole dialogue, Phaedrus, is about um, like it's about a bunch of stuff, but it's it's about like the the power of dialectic. That question, okay, kind of yeah, thing. all right. So Socrates is basically making a point that writing isn't as good as dialogue. Okay, right, like. Dialogue is what gets you in touch with your memory, which gets you in touch with knowledge. And that's how you lead to truth. You know, writing is like you said, you know, people will know a lot of stuff and not actually be wise. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> the watcher, like the watcher is pointing out if Thoth could have only thought of Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really destroy our memories. Yeah. Man. It's all at our fingertips and we don't have to remember anything because you can just look it up. <laughs> Man. All right, buddy. Uh, yeah. That was fantastic. So, yeah, I guess uh, what uh, I got a little bit one more real quick thing, but no problem. Go I don't for know it. If you guys had any questions or 
No, I think you ideas you wanted to talk about. I think the the dialogue we had during it was excellent. I'm gonna have to think about it a lot. Yeah. And we'll have to get you back on and do some actual Bronze Age. Come on, man. Well, that's what <laughs> Critias, Critias is, is for the Bronze Age. Okay. <laughs> the Critias dialogue. All right, cool. <laughs> we can have you back on for Critias. <laughs> but yeah, I found well, I guess I, I found all of this fascinating, and I, I really like you know you the the way you sort of took us through like here's how the like let's look at what these guys say let's look at the context let's look at the problems of possible translation issues all of it was fantastic so yeah. it was excellent yeah. thanks um yeah i just want to before i'm done i just want to say one thing real quick so uh i mean we mentioned a few times the discord and the snake pit but i mean I, seriously i wouldn't probably be on the show right now uh if it wasn't for all the help they've given me and like just my research and inspiration and stuff uh, as far as conducting the research in the first place. Yep. Um, so they're all a bunch of big sweethearts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, I just, this was from Menno, uh, this line here. So I thought it was relevant to the snake pit. Um, Some things I have said of which I am not altogether confident, but that we shall be better and braver and less helpless if we think that we ought to inquire than we should have been if we indulge in the idle fancy that there was no knowing and no use in seeking to know what we do not know. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So that's the whole point of the pit is uh, seeking what you don't know. And if anybody who's listening wants to tell me I'm wrong about anything, that's where you can do it. That's right. Just join the Discord and come skirt me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah, bro. I'm going to go in there and tell you you're wrong right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, too, I'll just bring this up real quick. I did... Uh, a couple months ago, start a, a blog at yes. Francis.fyi. I haven't really done a whole lot with it. There's some, there's like eight or so blog posts on there, but there is a whole bunch of sources I put on there. Yes. So if people are curious, there is a bunch of just material on there for you to read that isn't stuff I've written, but just like source material. Uh, and then there are also my hot takes on there too, but I haven't written anything recently and I probably should get back to that. So. Yeah, that's good. Cause I was going to ask you if you wanted to say that, cause you, you showed it to me a long time ago and I read through a bunch of it and I was like, man, this is great. So I do yeah, encourage. It, yeah. It's uh, it. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a programmer by nature. So I, I kind of wanted a little programming project and that's what I did. And then I don't know, writing blogs takes a while too. And I kind of got back into the research part. So then I stopped writing them. So yeah, <laughs> but I'll, I'm sure I'll get back into writing them at some point, but uh, yeah, that, that's a, that I have a bunch of sources on there. So feel free to, to check that out um, as well. Yep. So Atlantis. get a hold of FYI. Yeah. Atlantis.fyi or get a hold of him in the discord and tell him he's totally wrong about everything you said. So uh. <laughs> yeah, the discord is the best way to get a hold of him. That's right. <laughs> I'm on Twitter, but I just talk about politics on there. So yeah, yeah. Stay away from him. <laughs> Stay away from him on Twitter. Well, you Stay away from me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're also, I see that you're talking to, uh, you talk to quite a few, uh, academics on Twitter and you're kind of pushing them on their positions on things like the younger dryas. That's good. So yeah, I, I like to skirt academics. I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm the skirt in the discord and I'm also the academic skirt. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm just always a skirt. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's his job. <laughs> always be skirping. <laughs> Extraordinaire. <laughs> all great. right. Well, you guys all know you can get a hold of us at brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, brothers of the serpent.com. You can follow us uh, us on Twitter. We don't ever talk politics on Twitter. It's uh, at Snake Rose and No Vowels, S-N-K-B-R-S. Give us reviews wherever you can. That always helps the show. And thanks to all of you who have given us reviews. And uh, check out Pod Doodles. He's great. Uh, History Shift makes all of our videos, and he made this one. So if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, this is his work. So thanks very much to him. Thank you, buddy. That's right. Thanks to Jeff, who runs the Discord, and all the other admins and all the other snakes in there. Uh, you guys make it great. Uh, every day I enjoy the Discord so much. So uh, thank you guys so much. And this is it's kind of been the source of the last couple of shows. The reason we've got Marty on here and we've got Tony on here, these guys showed up in the Discord. So one of our dreams in starting this podcast was to start a discussion with other people out there in the world that like to think about this kind of stuff. And that's exactly what we're doing. That's why we're bringing people who listen to our podcast, who have joined in the discussion in the chats, onto the show, because this is exactly what we wanted to do. You know, not just talk to authors and other guests, but just programmers and, you know, monster truck builders that like think about these kind of things. Bring them on the show and let's hear what they think. So yep. this has been fantastic. Thanks so much, Tony. And, yeah, thank uh, you, buddy. Yep, and oh, to everybody else. Yeah, and to everybody else, we love you. Always have. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and thanks for the watcher. <laughs> and we love you. Always have. Always will. Good night. Get back to work. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs>